Uh, which board members are we missing? Ms. Cuevas and Ms. Hernandez? No, Mr. Panas. Mr. Panas. Cuevas and Panas. I'm here. Hello. Let's wait uh, one more, two more minutes to see if uh, Trustee Cuevas and Trustee Panas uh, join us right now. Hi there. Great. Welcome, Mr. Panas. So at this point, we are only missing uh, board member Cuevas. I'll send her. Thank you, Casey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Duffy. So I would like to call the April 8th, 2020, uh, West Contra Costa Unified School District Board of Education meeting into order. Um, thank you for joining us tonight for this second completely virtual meeting. Sorry, I, um, one second, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Thank you. I thought I was muted. Thank you for joining us tonight for our second completely virtual meeting. We remain in uncharted territory as we deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. And I would like to thank our employees, our families, and the entire West Contra Costa Unified School District community for how you have supported each other and come together during these unprecedented times. I would like to start the meeting with some basic instructions regarding how we're going to be using Zoom today and involving members of the public. All board members and the superintendent will be on video throughout the board meeting. Staff members also present are also present and will be on video. Members of the public will not be on video and will be muted except during public comment. During public comment periods, any member of the public who wishes to speak needs to electronically raise their hand. Raise your hand. In order to be recognized to speak, you must raise your hand when the item is announced and leave it raised. No one will be called to speak unless they have a first and last name. No nicknames or business names will be called to speak. Tonight, we will be able to accept public comment in Spanish. If you would like to give public comment in Spanish, when you are called, please request an interpreter. As you talk, please pause after every 30 seconds or so to allow the interpreter the opportunity to translate your words. Um, do we have any public comment for a closed session? We do not. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Walton. So I would like for us to um, recess to closed session now. Thank you.
Hey, Rainer, are you there? This is David. Can you unmute? Okay. Yep, I hear you. Did you are you signed in with the laptop that I gave you earlier today? So I see Otilia, but you you are also signed in. Are you guys in the same room? So I see her signed in. Um, can, but as an interpreter, can you text me um, at my number that I gave you in the email? Okay. Thanks. So Atilia, I hear you. So I can hear you on the Spanish channel, so that's good. So it looks like you're signed in and I can only, cause I have a different computer set up and I hear you on the Spanish channel only. So if you switch to the English, then you will be on the English channel. Yes. Yep, you should be on the Spanish. So I think you're good. I think um, I can hear you now. Yes. No, but are you using the same laptop that I gave you this morning? Okay. Yeah, the four, yep, 491. So you're in the meeting, but it's, you're not signed in with the correct, with the Google account, which I'm not sure why. Yeah, so if it asks you to log in, if you see an option to sign in with Google, do that and then select her district account. But so do you guys want the both laptops? I thought you guys were just gonna use the one. Because if you're in the same room, you could have feedback issues if you have them. I think at this point, yeah, it, that would be a good idea. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Is that okay? Okay, so I think that'll work for this meeting. In the future, I think we can just, we can use the two different ones, but the way we did it this morning was the one, and I think that'll, that'll work out best. Okay, so then I, I need to sign out so that it doesn't with Yes, yep, on your laptop, yep. Okay, yep, I saw that you, you're left. So Atilia is still on and she's in the Spanish channel. So I think you guys are, are good to go. Um, the only thing you need to do is when we take public comment, um, if it's a Spanish speaker, you just switch over, click on the English. Yep, and then you just speak and translate on the fly as, as they're speaking. Yes. So when you're in Spanish, you'll hear it in, in your earpiece and then you just translate. Okay. 
Spanish the whole time, and they are not going to hear only the other people. Only the Spanish speakers that have selected that option will hear you. Yep. And if no, if the is going to tell us or make a comment, are we going to be able to hear him if we try to do it? Yes. Yep. So even if you're in the Spanish queue, you're going to hear everything. You'll hear everybody talking. Oh, but if Mr. I mean, if Mr. Marcus tries to teach us separate, like a particularly louder or comments like that, he will have to call us or text us? Yeah, he'll have to call or text you. Yep. Or are you going to do that? I think he'll he'll take care of that. So if, if if there's any anything needs to change, he'll either call or text. Yeah, I mean I'm not sure if the other people are gonna hear his comments. Like if Mr. Marcus is gonna he won't be saying that over over the um the, the board meeting. show the person interpreter and I'm going to show also the main, right? Yes. Yep. Okay. Right. No, and in, in, in future meetings we'll have you both signed on in, in different laptops and so it'll it'll state that. But Yep. That's how we're going to do it. Absolutely. That's, that sounds like a good system. Yeah, otherwise, we, our throat starts to be open. Sure. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Any questions, Becky? No, I'm fine. So, should I mute it now? Or? Uh, you can mute now. And then when they reconvene at 4 30, just uh, unmute yourself.
I don't see her. Yeah, I don't see her in the attendee pool either. I can call her if you want to start with the opening procedures or text her. Please uh, check with Trustee Lara to make sure she um, gets support if she needs to get into the meeting. Welcome everybody. Thank you for uh, joining us today for our April 8th, 2020 uh, Board of Education of the West Contra Costa Unified School District meeting. Um, thank you for joining us tonight for the second completely virtual meeting. We remain in uncharted territory as we deal with the COVID-19 pandemic and I would like to thank our employees, our families and our, the entire WCCUSD community for how you have supported each other and come together during these really unprecedented times. I would like to start with some basic instructions and information about how we are going to be using Zoom today and involving members of the public. All board members and the superintendent will be on video throughout the board meeting. Staff members are also present and will be on video. Members of the public will not be on video and will be muted except during public comment. During public comment periods, any member of the public who wishes to speak needs to electronically raise their hand. In order to be recognized to speak, you must raise your hand when the item is announced and leave it raised. No one will be called to speak unless they have a first name and last name. No nicknames or business names will be called to speak. Tonight, we will be able to accept public comment in Spanish. If you would like to give public comment in Spanish, when you are called, please request an interpreter. As you would talk, please pause after every 30 seconds or so to allow the interpreter the opportunity to translate your words. Esta noche también vamos a tener, uh, vamos a aceptar comentario público en español. Si le gustaría dar su comentario en español, por favor, cuando se ha llamado, uh, pida una, una interpretadora, una traductora. Cuando usted hable, por favor, pause cada 30 segundos para dejar que uh, la traductora tenga la oportunidad de traducir las palabras que dice. Thank you, everybody. And with that, I would like to uh, begin with our Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Can we please have the roll call? I did that last time, so let me go ahead and do that. So, uh, Trustee Hernandez Jarvis. Present. Trustee Panis. Present. Trustee Cuevas. Here. Trustee Phillips. Present. Trustee Lara. Yes, I'm here. Oh, great. Thank you, Superintendent Duffy. Uh, Mr. Duffy, do we have a report out of closed session? We do not. Thank you. At this point in our meeting, we uh, will review the number of requests to address the board that we have uh, for a comment on individual agenda items. Mr. Walton, do we have any of this information yet? Uh, we have one person with their hand raised, but no, we cannot track uh, by, um, by uh, item. Thank you for that information. At this point in our agenda, we will review the agenda, make any changes as needed and adopt it. Board members, do you have any changes you would like to make to the agenda? I've got no changes, I'll move we approve it as proposed. Thank you, Trustee Panas uh, moves for approval of the agenda as proposed. Trustee Cueva second. Trustee Cueva seconds the approval of the meeting. Motion by Trustee Panas. Can we please uh, have a roll call vote? Just state your name before you, say your vote. Thank you. Phillips, yes. 
mañana, Shias. Guava, yes. Laura, yes. Hernandez Jarvis, yes. Thank you, board. And that leads us to our public comment. Thank you, President Hernandez Jarvis. Uh, we have two public uh, comment at the moment. The first is Matt Horton. Mr. Horton, go ahead and unmute and you can speak. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for uh, letting us talk again. Uh, this is my third time coming in front of you. My name is Matt Horton, a uh, parent of a Lupine Terrell's child. Uh, just coming forward to once again, um, Urge you guys to support our principal staying in place uh, next year. We've uh, we've since been in touch with uh, one of the board members, and I would like to uh, thank you again for reaching out to our PTA staff um, and speaking with us to let us know how we can move forward. Um, so I just wanted to uh, once again come in for come forward and say uh, that we really do support our principal, and that we'd like to keep her on next year, um, and that we're going to continue to work uh, with whom we can to get that up on, in front of your. Um, get you guys to vote on it again. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Joanna Pace. Ms. Pace, please unmute. Good evening, board. This is Joanna Pace uh, with uh, publiccore.net. Uh, we first want to thank the staff members who've made it possible to make this change in this unprecedented time. We know it's a lot of extra work for the, the um, staff members, but we value um, accountability and uh, transparency. So we appreciate very much all the extra work that staff members have had to do uh, in addition to getting all the students and staff uh, into distance learning. So we appreciate that the, uh, they've um, helped make this meeting available to us. My only question about how the meeting is run for the sake of transparency, is there any way to in this Zoom meeting have a display that shows those who are watching the meeting how many participants there are. I don't see uh, if the staff can give the public some direction about how to what to do in order to see how many participants are in the Zoom meeting from minute to minute. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be David Perry. Mr. Perry, go ahead and unmute and you can speak. Hi, good evening, superintendent and board members. My name is David Perry and I'm a concerned Hercules community member and parent of a West Contra Costa Unified School District student. Our community is often overlooked in the district and I was shocked and surprised to hear that the principal of Blue Pine Hills is being let go. Stakeholders need to be heard and involved board members please hold the district accountable and ensure that the community is heard in this process miss hernandez jarvis please speak up for the community of hercules thank you thank you for your comment thank you uh the next speaker is tj warfield miss uh warfield please unmute and you'll be able to speak Thank you. Um, I am also a parent of a child at Lupine Hills here in Hercules and want to also thank Mr. Phillips for engaging with us both on Facebook and working with our, um, our PTA president to get us some sort of progress on the issue of keeping our principal. Um, when we got our principal, the district seemed very engaged and wanting to make sure that we found a right fit. We found a right fit. Please do everything that you can to encourage our district to and hold our district administrators accountable to not just kick someone to the curb for whatever reason when she is truly amazing. Um, vote to keep her in. And if you do not, um, we need to know what you are going to do as board members to replace all of the programs that she has single-handedly put in place. Uh, this week, we've got the drama club. There's book club, writing club, soccer, basketball, dance, uh, family code nights, all of these things that she has done on her own without district resources. Do not take her away. Do not take these programs away from us. Um, and if for some reason you make the wrong decision and do let her go, what are you going to do to make sure those additional enrichment programs are not taken away? 
we've never had them. We need them. We need her. We need a leader. Um, she is the one that is the best thing for our school. Please make sure that our, our administrators are accountable and don't kick someone to the curb when she is so desperately needed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Henry Jake. Mr. Jake, go ahead and uh, unmute. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Mr. Jake. So um, I'm actually a 18 year old guardian of my brother. And um, um, <laughs> You know, it's hard. It's hard. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Okay, we're moving on to the next speaker, Sarah Maxwell. Miss Maxwell. <laughs> Hello, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay, thank you. Hello, board members and superintendent. My name is Sarah Maxwell and I am a parent of three children at Lupine Hills Elementary School in Hercules. I am here to speak on behalf of the dismissal of Dr. Merce's position as principal at Lupine Hills. I also wanna thank you, Mr. Phillips, for communicating with the Lupine family and giving us your support. I can't tell you how much it's been appreciated during this unknown um, territory. I am disheartened to say that no one has contacted myself or other community members to find out what we think about Dr. Mursa being dismissed as our leader. Um, furthermore, the executive director has failed to communicate with stakeholders. Stakeholders are a vital piece to the puzzle and we have a voice. Students, families, and communities should be involved in any dismissal of a principal. We are counting on you as trusted board members, Ms. Hernandez Jarvis, Ms. Lara, Ms. Cuevas, Mr. Panas, and Mr. Phillips to ensure that WCCUSD follows proper protocols and procedures. As an elected official, Ms. Hernandez, Excuse me, Ms. Hernandez Jarvis, the community of Hercules is looking for you to take leadership and hold the district accountable. Too often, Hercules schools are overlooked, and when you were elected, we trusted that you would represent our underrepresented community. We are pleading with the board to take action. We need you to show leadership. Um, and one more thing I just want to say during this unprecedented time, Dr. Mirsa has shown resilience and excellent leadership skills in orchestrating a very successful virtual parade in which she had teachers um, drive around the community and wave to their students. And let me tell you, that was the highlight of this quarantine for my children thus far. Um, on top of that, she is reading to students and interacting with them on Zoom each night, not right now because we're <laughs> during spring break right now, but she's also um, trying to set up a virtual drama club. So she's really taking things to the next level. And this is the leader that we need at our school. We thank you for supporting our kids and our future. Whatever you do, support Dr. Mercer. You will not regret it. And if I have one moment, my kindergartner wants to say something really quick. And can you please keep my picture ball? Because I really love her. And that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. President Hernandez Jarvis. Yes, um, who is? This is Trustee Phillips. Yes, Trustee Phillips. It sounded like the previous person, I think his name was Jake, the 18 year old. It sounded like he may have been crying uh, while he was talking. Uh, I couldn't quite tell, but if that was the case, um, is it possible for staff, uh, particularly considering that he's 18 and has a minor that he's caring for, is it possible for staff to give him a phone number uh, that he could perhaps call tomorrow uh, to express whatever he was trying to express because it sounded like it was a kid crying on the phone to me. Thank you, Trustee Phillips. Um, Mr. Walton, is there any way to uh, 
follow up to get contact. I don't know if the, the participant um, is still signed on right now. Uh, there seems to be, there will be an email that is connected to his uh, sign in. So we will be able to track that down. Yes. Okay, thank you. So if you can follow up and provide that information, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Phillips. The next speaker will be Don Gosney. Thank you very much. Yeah, like some of the other speakers, I appreciate all the effort that the board and the staff is going through to make these meetings as public as they are. I said, this is uncharted territory where we've just never done it before. A month ago, if somebody says we needed to Zoom, I'd assume that that was something uh, teenagers would be doing illicitly with some uh, drugs that they shouldn't be playing around with. But uh, you know, I spent my entire adult life in heavy construction and every time we would have a major milestone event, we would host a post-mortem where the stakeholders would gather and try to figure out what worked and what didn't work. If it worked, then let's do that again. And if it didn't work, let's make sure we never do that again. It's something you might consider uh, after each one of these meetings, and especially listening to the public, those of us that are sitting here at our, our homes. Because we're going to school on this. Every one of these meetings, we're learning something new about how to conduct a meeting virtually. And keep in mind that if we send in suggestions, it's constructive criticism. We're not just complaining. <clears throat> we're trying to find a better way to make things happen. That we're meant to, to, to try to find or to help find the best way to host these meetings and best serve our uh, community. I see one of the big differences between our last meeting and this one, people said we need to have a way to, to involve interpreters. And that's exactly what you've done. You've made that correction on here. I applaud that even if I'm not going to take use of it or make use of it. But something that would be helpful is, I know that for in, in order to watch the meeting at a later time, we are being provided with a link to where we can look at on Zoom site for the video. But I think as a host, maybe you have the option of, of actually getting a hard copy of the video where you can post the video. That way we could download it and archive it on our own computers. That way we don't have to have internet access. Uh, there's a lot of concern from people that, that are scared to death about the security flaws that Zoom has. And so they would refuse to participate in Zoom. But having the video on, on the district's website might be a solution to that problem. But thank you again. And I look forward to the rest of the meeting. Thank you for your comment and your suggestions. The next uh, speaker is Aiden, Aiden Fuller. Uh, Ms. And go ahead and unmute and you can speak. Yeah, hello, I'm a student at Lone Pine School and I have, have a problem. Why is there a nigger entry specs on my screen? I'm sorry to our community uh, that just heard that right now, and I apologize to all of our staff and community and board members and children and families present. Um, there's no room to tolerate any of this type of hate or racism at any of our meetings or in our communities or schools. I apologize for that. The next I, I also want. I just want to add, we're going to talk a little bit later um, during our COVID update just about video calls and video safety. Um, so we have every protocol in here to be as safe as possible. And we are still, you know, vulnerable to that type of stupidity. Um, so I also apologize and just want the community to know we're doing everything we can to still have a public uh, forum that's respectful and tolerant. So we'll have a chance to talk about that a little bit later uh, today. So we can continue to move on with public comment. Sorry that that happened. Thank you, Mr. Duffy. And I'm sorry again to the community that we had this occur right now. We are gonna continue working to make our meetings more secure and prevent this type of blatant racism and horrible behavior from happening. Thank you. The next speaker is Xu Peng. Hey, uh, I just wanted to come on here. <laughs> we'll move on to the next speaker. Uh, no, that is the final speaker in public comment. Thank you, Mr. Walton, and thank you so much for being quick to, um, to mute as needed. 
Um, board members, we are going to move on now. Thank you. Um, as we work through these issues and we uh, continue to have a respectful conversation and meeting. Up next in our agenda, we have our business items. Uh, we have two items here. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Logan, for setting it up. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Thank you, Trustee Panas. So the first uh, business item that we have on the consent calendar is uh, the CBOC appointment of Cameron Moore. And just, um, just a reminder that we do take these consent items as a whole all of them, we do just only have two tonight. Um, so we would ask for a motion on all of them unless somebody wanted to pull one for a particular reason. Madam okay. President, Trustee yes. Cuevas, I'd, yes. like I'd like to move approval of um, both these items on the consent calendar. I'll second that, Trustee Panis. Thank you, so uh, moved by Trustee Cuevas, seconded by Trustee Panas. Board, can we please have a, a vote? State your name first, please. Phillips, yes. Panas, yes. Trustee Cuevas, yes. Laura, no. Hernandez Jarvis, yes. Um, both appointments are approved by the board. Uh, 4100 zero, zero, with Trustee Lara voting no. Thank you, board. Up next, we have our action items. Today, we have our action items first. Um, so item D1 is our presentation of the 2018-2019 bond financial audit report. Good evening, President Hernandez Jarvis. Um, tonight, we have several audits to present. Michael Ash from Christie White should be with us and being brought in to go through the presentation. Once I hear Michael's on, I'll stop and let him go through. These are very positive audits. Um, there were no critical findings in the financial audits. After we do the financial audits for Measure D and Measure E and the parcel tax, we'll move on to the performance audit by Moss Adams for the bond, which will be done as our third presentation. Is Michael on board? Yes, I'm here, Tony. Can you hear me? You're, you're good to go. You just tell Tracy when to change slides. Sounds good. Um, well, thank you everybody for having me here tonight. I'm here to present uh, the financial audit for the 2010 Measure D and 2012 Measure E bonds. Um, as you probably know, every Prop 39 bond has to go undergo a financial and performance audit each year. Um, I'm here to just present the financial audit. You'll hear the performance audit piece later from Moss Adams. And um, as Tony said, the results are very good. We presented this to your COC uh, back in March, which was only a month ago. It seems like about a year ago. So, um, but I am happy to, that I can present good news tonight. So next slide, please. Uh, so these are just the audit objectives um, and about a financial statement audit. So with the financial statement audit, we're looking as the independent auditors, we're looking at the fairness and presentation of the financial statements and the related disclosures. And in that we put our independent auditors report. Um, and it's important to note that we're only issuing an opinion on the 2010 Measure D and 2012 Measure E bond building funds. So we're not actually giving an opinion on the whole district. Next slide, please. Um, this is the opinion paragraph that I copied from the independent auditor's report. It's an unmodified opinion, which is the best that you can have. So in our opinion, the financial statements referred to above present fairly in all material respects. Um, so that is an unmodified opinion. That's the best that you can possibly have. Um, next slide, please. Um, and then these are just some of the substantive procedures that we do as part of our financial audit. Um, with a bond program, usually cash is gonna be your biggest item. So we look at the bank reconciliation that you have with the county, cash and county treasury, and just make sure that that agrees. Um, 
You do have a small amount of accounts receivable, usually related to fourth quarter interest from that cash and county treasury. Um, accounts payable is another big item that we look at. So we're looking at the cutoff and reviewing those balances to make sure that they're stated properly. Um, and then revenue and expenses, that's the same thing, just looking at the transactions throughout the year and making sure that they're recorded properly. Um, you did not have any new issuances in uh, fiscal year 2019, so we didn't have to do anything related to that. Um, next slide, please. Um, and I believe that this is the last slide. So um, Prop 39 bond financial audits are required to be done under what's called government auditing standards. So we do look at your internal controls over financial reporting. We don't give an opinion on those. Um, but if we do come across any that we identify as significant deficiencies or material weaknesses, we do have to rec report those as findings. Um, we're also not giving an opinion on compliance in this financial audit, but we, if we do come across any um, that could have a direct and material effect on the financial statement amounts, we would have to report that as well. And I'm happy to say we had no significant deficiencies, no material weaknesses, and no reportable items noted related to compliance and other matters. And I believe that concludes my presentation. Um, are there any questions? Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Ash, for your presentation. Uh, before we go to comments or questions from the board, I would like to know if uh, there's any public comment for this item. Yes, President Hernandez Jarvis, there, there's one public comment at the moment. Thank you. And I would just like to remind everybody that if you'd like to uh, have a public comment that you need to uh, make sure you press the raise your hand button. Um, and if you're connected uh, by the phone, on your phone, please click uh, asterisk nine. And if you would like to have the Spanish uh, translation, make sure that you click the interpretation button at the bottom of your screen and select Spanish. Uh, Mr. Walton will call each member of the public who has raised their hand either by name or for those who have called in by the last three digits of their phone number. Thank you. Mr. Walton, did you say there was one public um, speaker? Yes, uh, the first public comment is Don Gosney. Mr. Gosney, go ahead and unmute yourself and you can speak. You have three minutes. Thank you very much. You know, although I serve as the chair of the Bond Oversight Committee, I speak tonight only as a private citizen who happens to serve on the Bond Oversight Committee. I have not been given the authority to speak on this issue tonight representing the CBOC. We recently had an opportunity to review the draft financial audit and hosted a telephone conference call with Christy White, not only to hear what they had to say, but to provide them with comments and ask questions. Unlike a performance audit, a financial audit is unlikely to have any areas of real concern. Either the numbers add up or they don't. In this case, they pretty much added up. We appreciate the work and efforts of staff and Christy White and have no issues of substance to bring before you. Thank you. So we would just ask the board to vote to receive the audit. Thank you, uh, Mr. Gosney. Thank you, Dr. Wold. Uh, do any board members have any questions or comments? We're gonna go in this order today. Uh, Trustee Lara, Trustee Cuevas, Trustee Panas, and Trustee Phillips, and then myself. Uh, and I don't have any questions. Trustee, Trustee um, Lara, thank you. Trustee Phillips Cuevas Urbanas. I don't have, this is Trustee Phillips. I don't have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Phillips. Trustee Panas, it looks like you're speaking, but we can't hear you. Thank you. Uh, this is Trustee Panas. I'll accept that. I'll move that we accept the uh, the 2019 bond financial audit report for the 2010 Measure D and 2012 Measure E bonds. Trustee Cuevas, second. Oh, sorry. Uh, Trustee Panos, move that we accept the bond financial audit for 2018, 2019, and Trustee Cuevas second it. Uh, board members, can we please have a vote? Please state your name before your vote. Phillips, yes. Anna, yes. Trustee Cuevas, yes. Lara, yes. Hernandez Jarvis, yes. Uh, 
Um, you not, uh, I'm so sorry. Uh, where's the page? So the board has um, accepted the present the 2018-2019 bond financial audit report. Right. Thank you, President. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Jarvis. Thank you, Thank you. And our next item is action item D2, presentation of the WCCUSD measure G, parcel tax audit as of June 30th, 2019. And so this is a similar, because it's a different ballot measure, it also needs to have a financial audit. Christy White did the audit and again, it's very positive. So Michael Ash will quickly go through the presentation, then we'll ask again for a vote to receive this audit. Michael, are you still there? Or I think did... I'm back. I think I believe I'm back now. Can you hear me? Yep, you're there. Okay, perfect. All right. So I'm also going to present the uh, financial and performance audit for the Measure G parcel tax um, for 2019. Uh, parcel tax audits are not as common as bond audits. Um, every Prop 39 uh, bond audit has to have an audit. Every Prop 39 bond has to have an audit each year. Uh, parcel taxes are not required to unless they are. Um, it states so in the ballot language, which yours does. So we do do a financial and performance audit on Measure G. Uh, next slide, please. Um, it looks very similar to, to the bond. It's just giving an overview of what a financial audit does. Um, and then we're only issuing an opinion on the Measure G parcel tax activity for the year. Next slide, please. Again, you had an unmodified opinion on the financial statements. It's the best that you can possibly have. Um, in our opinion, the financial statement presents fairly the Measure G activity for the period beginning July 1st, 2018 and ending June 30th, 2019. Next slide, please. Um, again, we did it under government auditing standards. So if we did come across the internal control over financial reporting, significant deficiencies, material weaknesses, or any compliance um, with certain, non-compliance with certain provisions of laws, we would have had to report that. And I'm happy to say no significant deficiencies, no material weaknesses, and no reportable items noted. Uh, next slide, please. Um, a performance audit. So this is a definition of a performance audit. A performance audit is very judgmental and very specific. So um, the performance audit that we do for the parcel tax, um, or even that we would do if we were to do um, for a Prop 39 bond might look much different from the performance audit that you're getting um, for your Prop 39 bond. Um, so next slide, please. These are some of the objectives that we did um, regarding the performance. Um, verifying that Measure G expenditures were accounted for separately in the accounting records of the district. Verifying the net revenues received or deposited. Um, this is a new one and th this, is, this is a big change from last year. Trustee Phillips uh, brought up a great point uh, when I was presenting last year at the board meeting um, and it was related to the charter school money. So um, as part of a settlement that the district had with some of the charter schools, a portion of that parcel tax has to go to those charter schools. And the district as part of that settlement does have some oversight responsibility and, and can do some things. And that wasn't always done in the past. I think it was, um, they were looking at it for some charters, maybe not, 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 not for others. And so under new leadership, starting when you had um, your internal audit director, Grace, she started it off and then continuing under Dr. Wold's tutelage when she left, um, the district um, and myself, we reviewed through um, that settlement agreement and came up with some procedures that the district could do to ensure that the charter schools were spending that money properly. So the district is obtaining expenditure reports for every charter school um, and just making sure that those expenditure reports agree for the agree with the allowable um, coding for the allowable things that the parcel tax money can be spent on. And the district is also obtaining the charter school audit reports and looking at those and making sure that there's some statement from the charter school auditor um, to make sure that the me measure G parcel tax activity is included in there somewhere. So that's a big difference from last year and kudos to the district for doing that. Um, the, other, the, other, the other big thing that we do is we look at the expenditures. We've always done this, this hasn't changed much. We pick a sample of expenditures, take the expenditures, take the supporting documentation and just make sure that it's spent on allowable things under measure G. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and this is our performance opinion. So in our, mod in our opinion, the district expended them for the purposes approved by the voters. So that's another unmodified opinion. Uh, very good. Uh, next slide, please. I think that might conclude. Um, are there any questions that I can help answer? Thank you, Mr. Ash, for the presentation. Um, Mr. Walton, is there public comment? There's no public comment on this item. Thank you. Um, board members, um, 
we are being uh, asked uh, to approve uh, and accept this audit. Uh, do any of you have any comments or questions? This is Trustee Cuevas is saying no. Okay, Trustee Phillips, I'm sorry. Uh, this is Trustee Phillips, thank you. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to staff uh, and the auditors for following up on the issue around uh, the charter schools uh, and making sure that they too are spending uh, their parcel tax dollars uh, correctly. So uh, just the kudos and I appreciate uh, the work you all are doing. Thank you, Trustee Phillips. Uh, this is Trustee Pass, I have a couple of, of questions. Um, Mr. Ash, I, I know at the parcel tax meeting in February, it was noted that the county uh, to cover their costs keeps about $55,000 of the parcel tax revenue. Is it reasonable to disclose that in future audits just so people can see the numbers add up all the way? Yes, I think that's, that's fine. We're more than happy to put that in there. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'll make also, a note. I'll follow up on what, what Trustee Phillips said. I, we're really seeing much better compliance from the charter schools than we have in the past. So we appreciate your efforts there as well as Dr. Wold and the other staff. A question for you. I know the cash balance this year uh, was 26,000 and last year it was 142,000. Is there a lot of, of float of accounts receivable or payable or something that causes those difference? Because before that, the, the balance was different as well. Yes, uh, doc, Dr. Wold might have more input on exactly what it is, but yeah, the flow timing um, has a lot, a lot to do with it. Again, we're just looking at the balance as of a certain date. So there may have been just some timing differences year over year that caused that. Okay, but some, sometimes you may have a position accounted for in the parcel and that person leaves a month early or comes a little late. And so it changes the cash balance at the last minute when you're reconciling. Okay, thank you. I don't have any other questions. Thank you, Trustee Panas. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ash, and thank you, Dr. Wold. I don't have any questions. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, Board, is there a motion to approve and accept the Measure G parcel tax audit as of June 30th, 2019? Oh, the Trustee Panas, I'll move we accept the parcel tax audit for as of June 30th, 2019. Thank you, Trustee Panos. Is there a second to Trustee Panos' motion? Second, this is Trustee Phillips. Trustee Phillips seconding the motion. Board, can we please have a vote? Phillips, Lara. yes. Lara, yes. Cuevas, yes. Panos, yes. Panos Jarvis, yes. And Trustee Phillips? Yes. Thank you. Um, the board unanimously approves the motion to approve and accept the Measure G parcel tax audit as of June 30th, 2019. Thank you, uh, Dr. Wold, and thank you, Mr. Ashen. Thank you, board. Our next item is action item D3, bond 2010 Measure D and 2012 Measure E performance audit for year and debt June 30th, 2019. So this audit's slightly different. Now we're dealing with the performance audit and Moss Adams has been our firm to do this. We have Stephen Bichetti that I believe is online and we'll get him locked in. Uh, Mark Steranka may join us a little later. He had a conflict at exactly 5.30, but Stephen, I, I see there, we just need to get him unmuted and he will go ahead and present this. And Stephen, as you go forward and unmute yourself, just say next slide for each slide and I'll leave it to you to present the performance audit. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. I'm so sorry to interrupt. I just want to make sure, is there any way to make the presentation larger on the actual screen that is being shared? Because I have it open in another window so I can see it um, bigger, but I just, I noticed that I can't make the screen any um, bigger, like for the public looking on, on a screen phone. Is it, is the picture of the speaker going to be bigger than the presentation itself? Is there any way to, to assist that? Uh, thank you, President Hernandez Jarvis. So I believe we have the presentation screen full screen um, and potentially alongside the presenter. So um, we will try to have the presenter presentation full screen in the center so that that's what the audience can see. 
And then we'll take feedback later to see if this is actually working. Thank you everyone for your patience. Great, thank you so much, Ms. Logan. Okay, Stephen. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Yes. Good. All right. Thank you for the opportunity to present our performance audit of your bond program. My name is Steve Bacchetti. I'm a senior manager at Moss Adams and I lead our construction advisory group. Um, we're very pleased to present the results. Overall, this is the best year that we've seen from West Contra Costa. So I'm really excited to dig in and highlight some of the, the great progress that's being made. Um, before doing so, I want to thank first Tony Wold, Margarita, uh, Margarita Romo, Melissa Payne, Louis Fries, and the CBOC for all their time and efforts. These uh, performance audits on the boat bond program are a substantial amount of work. It's a lot of back and forth in terms of the documentation to validate compliance with the public contracting code, ed code, et cetera. And some of one sample may require 15 documents. So it's substantial, it's comprehensive. So we appreciate everyone's time um, during this uh, report. Um, overall, we worked with the district to understand the status of efforts to strengthen the bond program. And um, we'll go over the good practices and some of the progress that's been made. And then in the interest of uh, keeping a brief and going to q and I'll highlight the three main areas that I think we should be focused on for, uh, especially with the passage of Measure R. Tell Tracy, next slide, yeah. Okay, so overview, we, we, the performance audit's a state requirement and it's required by the Ed Code. It's required on an annual basis. Uh, GAGIS is required to define the performance audit and related professional standards. Our scope, was for fiscal year 19 for measure E and measure D. Next slide, please. So I believe the next two or three slides are going over the objectives that we covered. We worked with the district to come up with the, obje the objectives, the scope methodology that we felt was appropriate to test these components to ensure that it lines up with Paul's procedures and or best practices. So I'm not going to read all these, but you can see that we're going over the staffing plan, cash flow management, reporting, bid and procurement, master planning, et cetera. And based off our experiences, these are the um, types of objectives that are critical to support a successful bond program. So I think it's this slide. Next slide, please. The next one, which includes material specifications, cost benefit value engineering analysis, proposed procedures, change order management, which is gonna be a huge area of focus, especially with COVID-19. So th this is a very important place to have lockdown going forward. Next slide, please. And then some of the, these other ones, with, I think maybe the, the special focus on this is the CBOC compliance and the transparency to the bond program as you guys have public stakeholders. Next slide, please. All right, overall, uh, we confirmed that 23 of the prior 25 recommendations were not fully addressed. There was 14 recommendations where steps had been taken, nine where no steps have been taken, and two where they were fully addressed by the district. Uh, we identified five new opportunities this time around. And then I think this is a, bit, a big stat that, that, that I think is meaningful, is of the 20 recommendations open, 12 relate to the pulse procedures development. So on the next slide, uh, we'll, we'll go over this, but the district has done a huge effort. So this is Melissa, Lewis, Tony, and team with getting pulse procedures, uh, although not formally adopted through our audit period, based off my understanding when we were doing field work, is very close to being finalized, at least in pieces. And we find that this is a, a huge, huge, huge area for, uh, of improvement that the district did. So not only does the pulse procedures offer your, uh, it's a great to training tool for staff, but when you start testing the operations against the pulse procedures, that's when you can start fine tuning and making sure that operations are efficient, effective, in line with, with best practices. So I just wanted to commend uh, Melissa Lewis and team for all their hard work on this documentation of pulse procedures is um, 
not necessarily the most fun thing. There's probably 14 other things at least that they could, um, would rather spend their time on, but it's, it's a great progress. Next, uh, the, the bond program master plan was presented to the board on May 22nd, 2019. Uh, you guys have a really good master plan document. Um, we have some other districts that actually have noted you guys having a very good master plan document, which is always good to hear. So great job on that. Um, the district maintains board approved design standards, including educational specifications, et cetera. Uh, the CBOC meets monthly and updates the district's website with the minute meeting minutes and stresses the importance of the Brown Act. You guys have a really good engaged and uh, very smart CBOC, so that's always great. Um, and finally, another good practice is the district utilizes project notification tools to notify local contractors of bid and RFP solicitations. And this is a great, a great um, uh, thing that the district does to make sure that you guys have a competitive pool to get good pricing on your construction contracts, et cetera. Next slide, please. All right, so the, the performance audit for the bond program is, we it's, it's two different areas. So one, you have the requirement that we have to validate the expenditures are compliant with the with the ballot language. That's the requirement, we have to do that. The second piece is all the expanded objectives that we go through. And those objectives have been fine tuned based off our team's experience with capital programs. So today I'm gonna go over the Prop 39, which is compliance, which is the minimum requirement. And then for the second piece, I'm gonna highlight the, the couple areas that um, to commend on the good progress and then things to look out for with the passage of me measure R. So first, we, we did our objectives and we noted that the bond proceeds were only list, expended on the listed projects for under measure D and measure E bond, bond language. Two, for district labor charges to the bond program, we, we continue to note that the district was unable to demonstrate that these charges were uh, based off timekeeping records. However, during the uh, fiscal year in June, a timekeeping study was performed uh, and based off my understanding, they're e evaluating or implementing uh, this or considering implementation of this timekeeping system for the current fiscal year. So it's, again, uh, based off best practices and consistent with opinion 04110, th there has to be a direct correlation with timekeeping. So timekeeping based off our uh, experience is the most uh, consistent to evidence that the time is truly uh, build to the bond program and a specific for each task. Um, so again, we noted it here, there's some good progress being made on this. Um, so that, that's our recommendation. Next slide, please. Okay. And then this goes into the staffing plan. So what I'm going to do here is instead of going through all the 24 slides, and I'm happy to do so if there's specific questions, I'd like, to, in, the, in the interest of being brief on the expanded uh, items, I wanna hit on the, the high level issues that I think are the most meaningful and critical for the, support, the, the success of the bond program. So as noted before, there's tw out of the 28 open recommendations, almost half of them related to the policy procedures, is my recommendation is for Lewis and Melissa and the team to continue to make strides in this area and as I stated earlier, the Pulse Procedures is gonna be a great tool for staff now and in the future, especially important with Measure R being implemented. So when you get it, the Pulse Procedures in place, that is kind of the starting line where you need to con confirm that the operations are consistent with the Pulse Procedures, that the Pulse Procedures are aligned with best practices, but this is a great first step. Second, uh, reporting, master planning, communication plans, and bidder procurement process were some of the issues that, uh, or observations that we have within our report. Um, the alignment with best practice is very critical now, in addition to formalized the pulse procedures. So with the, the passing of Measure R, the, the, um, the, the reporting on and commuting, communicating to all your stakeholders is critical to support an accountable and transparent successful program. So continue making efforts and strides in that area. Um, and the reporting should include both financial and non-financial metrics. And reporting, again, should be complete and accurate as much as possible. Uh, 
and should be continue to be reported on a consistent basis. So with it, and then finally within a report uh, with the passage of measure, measure R, we want to make sure that you guys are uh, starting out the program as successful as possible. So continued efforts with the master planning pulse procedures. We provided some criteria that we find is a great um, guidance uh, to formulate this. So continue referencing these types of best practices, continuing making sure that your master plan for the uh, completion of measure D and E and R are uh, consistently updated so that all stakeholders understand what's next on the list. Prior, the prioritization of the projects is clearly noted so that if and when a project potentially doesn't get to, it's very, it's very clearly understood. And then third, which I think this is, this is big, is the draft board policy surrounding the role and operation of the CBOC should be formalized. Uh, again, your CBOC is very, very engaged, has great experience and passion for the program, and ensuring the, pol the roles and responsibilities are clearly defined can only be helpful for the program. So I, I believe this area and implementing other best practices that we note specific to reporting master planning communications and bid, bid and procurement specifically uh, will, will help significantly. So. And then, uh, get my final note here. So overall, I think the district made great progress this, this year. And I firmly believe that fiscal year 1920 is gonna be a, a huge year where a lot of these issues are gonna be officially closed. And then we can start testing or whoever the next auditor is start testing to make sure that the operations are consistent with the pulse procedures and that the pulse procedures are uh, consistent with uh, uh, best practices to give your, uh, your school the best chance of having a, a successful bond program. And with that, I will open up to questions or concerns. And I'll jump in real quick before the questions. I think it's, it's the timing is one of those unique things because we're talking about actions that stopped in June of 2019 right now in this audit, we're not talking about anything that's happened since I've started and since Lewis started in his position. So all of those come in our next audit as we go forward. So we're almost a year in reverse as we're looking. So a lot of the progress doesn't show up in the audit as we go forward right now. But with that, we'll let board members ask any questions of Steve. Thank you, Dr. Wold. Um, thank you for the presentation as well. I. Um, I want to know first if we have any public comment on this item. There's one co public comment, and that's Don Gosney. Um, Mr. Gosney, go ahead and unmute. Thank you again. You know, as before, although I serve as the chair of the Bond Oversight Committee, I speak tonight only as a private citizen who happens to serve as the chair of the Bond Oversight Committee. I've not been given the authority to speak on this issue tonight representing the CBOC. As the chair of the CBOC, however, I have grave concerns about this audit. But at first, I want to thank the, the very, very hard work of the CBOC members on the audit subcommittee, uh, Vanessa Hill, Anton Youngher, Sally DeWitt, and Greg Vizanu, uh, who spent countless hours on this, and staff person Margarita Romo, who was very, very helpful uh, in reviewing all of this. My concerns focus on how the district has narrowed the scope of the audit so drastically that it paints a portrait that is not necessarily reflected in reality. My concerns are so severe that for more than a month, I considered throwing up my hands and just walking away from everything the WCCUSD does. Please keep in mind that this is my 52nd year of affiliation with the district, so this would be a life changer for me. Getting answers to very direct questions about the scope of the audit was nearly impossible because the scope had been narrowed so severely that the auditors, at least in my opinion, did not feel comfortable with giving me a straight answer about what they were even allowed to talk to me about. The scope has been narrowed to the point where the auditors weren't allowed to answer some of my questions unless they had been given permission from the district to discuss my questions. I had to get staff permission to even ask them if we could host a, t a telephone conference call. I'm not saying I needed permission to host the call. I needed permission just to ask them if this was an option. The performance audit covers a lot of ground, but at least in my opinion, 
Some of that ground revolves around the effectiveness of the community's oversight of the bond program. That is the effectiveness of the CBOC. After all, a large part of the bond program is community involvement and oversight. Both this year and last year, although the auditors did not specifically say that this was of little or no concern to them, they kept telling me that they were limited to the scope they were given by the district. All of our troubles with staff, with the board, with the board policy, with our diminishing membership, with our inability to communicate with the community, with our inability to get the reports we need to do our jobs, these were things that seemed to be outside of the scope of their audit. My point here is that until you allow the CBOC to help define the scope of the next performance audit, you're going to keep getting whitewashed reviews that don't tell the board or the public the truth about the performance of the bond program. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Gosney. That member? concludes public comment. Thank you, Mr. Walton. Board members, uh, the staff recommendation is to accept the report of the <clears throat> 2010 Measure D and 2012 Measure E performance audit for the year and that ended June 30th, 2019. Um, do any board members have any questions or comments? Madam President, I'd just like to move approval of this uh, audit. Thank move you, acceptance, move acceptance of this audit. Thank you, uh, Trustee Cuevas for moving. Trustee Panos, I will second that, but I also have a few questions. Thank you, Trustee Panos. <clears throat> Uh, Mr. Bichetti, thank you so much for your report. Um, and I appreciate your comments regarding our ongoing work. Um, there, as, as we noted, there's a lot of items that are still open. Um, when did you actually do your work? Was your work done like December to February or when was your work actually done? Yep. Uh, so good, good question. We started in October. We were on site in January and we completed field work through Feb through February. So our audit period only goes through June 30th, 2019. So that's our scope. If it happened before our audit year, we can't really make comment on it. If it happened after, um, we, we're not testing against this moving target. So what we did is we do know there's significant progress being made on a lot of these items that are open. So we noted that within the good practices section and want to make sure that that it was highlighted in this presentation because I think that's huge. Okay, thank you. Um, and I'd also like to thank you for your comments uh, regarding the efficacy and capability of our CPOC. That's a very hard working group. Um, I have a couple of questions that, that maybe they're better directed to Mr. Freeze or to Dr. Wold. Um, how many of the items that uh, were, um, I think there was 29 items that, that were remained open. Do I have that number correct? And where do we stand on those items now? Um, Lewis, do you want to respond? Yeah, so of the 28 items, 22 of those items are being addressed by the program management plan. <laughs> Okay. There are a couple other items out there. So um, one recommendation is based on procurement uh, from 2016 that we can't address. Um, one is timeliness of invoices, which we agree with. Two are gonna be addressed in the CBOC policy and the CBOC website. And one has to do with local participation. Okay. Um, and in terms of the local participation, is that, do we have major changes to do to implement that or where do we stand on that item? Uh, this is an issue that with the, the change in the way the DIR is, is responsible for the um, reporting where the contractor is actually responsible for the reporting or prevailing wage. Um, so we are not actually auditing that. It is up to the contractor to report that. But I would like to say, you know, the good news is on the Wilson project, where it is the responsibility of the contractor, we're showing about 55% local hire participation on that project. Okay, that's great. Uh, one more question. So uh, from your perspective, how are we doing on this item that it's, it's been open for a while about being able to properly allocate staff, uh, their, their time between bond and general fund or other projects? So I'll, I'll respond to that one. Um, 
Okay. When I walked in, one of the first <laughs> things I did with Lewis in July is we took an analysis of everyone that was funded by the bond and we made a very strict focus that unless we could have a direct correlation, we made sure that we've removed people from the bond that aren't drawing in. And we have a long-term plan to continue to ensure that there are fewer positions that are funded by the bond. We believe that the time accounting that we put in place this year will indeed meet all of the obligations of what have been outstanding for previous years and that we have fewer positions and only those dedicated positions built into the bond. So we, we have indeed taken that analysis and followed a best practice approach as it pertains to time accounting for the bond. That's great. And did that time accounting, is that process, did that start on July 1 or January 1 or? or... So the time accounting, why we did a, um, an audit back in June and July of last year, we are currently uh, time carding our staff right now. That actually started in March. Okay, so it started started last month. So yes. it'll be partial this year and then it'll be every after that, it will be the entire year. Correct. Correct, and, and that's part of our, our focus. We're trying to close out all of the issues that have been lingering for multiple years before we add any new scope. At the point that we've closed out and provided a comprehensive report to the board, will then get direction on what are the future needs and what are the future areas that we want to continue to pursue. But if we keep adding on top of things, we're never going to get to a final point with the current scope. And, and that's been one of our focus areas is clarifying and making sure that we fix all of the areas that have been brought forward from previous years so that we can move forward together. Okay, thank you very much. That's all my questions. Thank you, uh, Trustee Panas. Thank you, Dr. Wold. Uh, thank you for the presentation again, uh, Mr. Pacchetti. Uh, board members, do we have any further questions or are we ready to vote? Um, I actually have uh, a question. Trustee Phillips? Trustee Phillips. Yes, um, and it is regarding the local participation as well. Um, so currently, the district itself is not tracking local participation. Is that correct? We do not track it. We track it through our contractors. They're responsible for the DIR reporting of the prevailing wages where the information is pulled from. Okay. Um, just so we can back up a little bit, just for public consumption, what is local participation? So local participation, I believe it's divide, defined by the four areas within the county, and we have a radius that defines that um, with each one of the counties. And so that's how they measure the local participation. And it's those employees reporting from those uh, particular cities within the county. But and Lewis, then, isn't it part of our bid documents that we highly encourage and expect? Oh, absolutely. It's part of our documents that um, they are to provide uh, local participation within their projects. Trustee Phillips? Is Trustee Phillips still connected? Yes. Hello? There you yes. are. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, I need to stop hitting buttons. Um, so, uh, Mr. Fries, uh, can you just, in layman terms, talk about what local participation is? I, the point is for the, the public to, to actually know what it is. So the local participation is to encourage employees within the counties that revolve around West Contra Costa, so West Contra Costa, Alameda, Solano, um, to participate within our construction, construction projects. And so we monitor the numbers of those employees that report on the DIR, which is the prevailing wage, how many of them that the contractors are actually employing from the union halls. Okay, so it basically means that local folks get hired on our construction jobs in layman terms. Yes. Okay, and what we're doing right now is we're having the uh, contractors uh, who are working for the district uh, report um, what they're hiring. 
yes, we encourage that they promote and try to hire locally. Um, so you spend the dollars where the dollars are being paid by tax dollars. Um, and so that, that is the uh, part of the contract and the ask of the contractors. So my request, uh, Mr. Duffy, Mr. Freeze, the board, uh, is that, because this has come up more than once, and it's come up pretty much every year since I've been on the board. Uh, but my request is that we actually have, uh, a, I understand that it is in the bid documents, but that we actually have a board policy uh, around local hire, uh, and that the district actually start monitoring um, that. And the reason that I'm asking um, is the same reason that I've asked before. Um, the monies that are being spent on these construction projects are monies that are coming directly uh, out of this community. Um, these are the bonds that are being passed. Um, and while you know, I understand everybody who works on these projects are not gonna live you know, in West County, uh, but to the extent that uh, I, I would like to see, and I think most people would like to see uh, as many people as possible doing that. And I think that the board uh, really needs to take uh, a strong position, stronger position uh, on local hire. So I am asking uh, for a board policy uh, to come back to the board uh, regarding local hire. I know this is something that's come up in CBOC meetings as well. Peter Chow used to talk about it all of the time, um, and for good reason. Um, the monies that are spent, and these are hard times. And so the monies that are spent in our district should circulate in our district as many times as possible uh, before they go out of our district. We want as many people to touch those dollars that live here uh, and are qualified to do the work as possible. So that, those are my comments. But Mr. Duffy, um, I am requesting that uh, we get a board policy on local hire. Thank you. For the comments, I just, I'll make sure to work with uh, President and uh, staff to think through what that looks like, especially in conjunction with the mandatory language that's in the, the ballot language. Thank you, sir. Okay. Ma you. Madam President, can I follow up on that? Can we actually look at our project labor agreements and see if there's already policy language in there? Um, our project labor agreements often include local hire as part of the, um, what I believe is part of the uh, policy language. So it may just be an issue of uh, administrative regulatory um, um, feedback on how to actually implement and collect data on it. And I'll get back to you on what we've done in the past and what we have in policy already. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Cuevas, for your comment. And thank you, uh, trust, uh, Mr. Priest, as well. Um, and if I recall correctly, uh, Trustee Cuevas had moved that we accept the report or yes? Yeah, I, I'd like to call the question, Madam Chair. Great. The board, um, can we please take a vote? Uh, Cuevas, yes. Hannes, yes. Laura, yes. Phillips, yes. Hernandez-Travis, yes. So the, the report has been accepted unanimously by the board for the 2010 Measure D and 2012 Measure E performance audit for the year that ended on June 30th, 2019. Thank you, board, and thank you, staff. Our next item is D4, second interim report for uh, fiscal year 2019-2020. Thank you, President Hernandez-Jarvis. Um, I'll be brief. With this one, um, the second interim is our actual expenditures as of January 31st. So unfortunately, this report does not reflect any of the changing world that we're facing today. Um, I will do a little discussion as we talk about the governor's proposal. Next slide as we, we move forward. This is one of our formal reports. It normally is due by March 15th due to all of the shutdowns the county has given us till April 10th to certify our second interim report. We will, because we certified qualified, have to do a third interim, which will be actuals as of March 31st. And that will come to the board on May 20th. Next slide, please. Um, the certification's positive. 
uh, again, means that the district can and will be able to meet all its financial obligations with no mitigations for the current year and the two subsequent years. Qualified means that we may not, doesn't mean we won't, but means may not without mitigation. And the negative means we will not. At this point, we still, we have been making the correct um, actions. And so at this point, staff is recommending and has coordinated with the county that a qualified certification is still appropriate with the uncertainty of the state budget, as well as the fact that we still have reductions that we need to make for the next two years. A small amount still this year, which will be done on April 22nd, and then more reductions in the 2021 school year. So we're recommending a qualified because of our multi-year projection. We are not recommending a negative which would remove some of the oversight possibly for the board because we believe the board has taken the appropriate actions to be fiscally um, responsible and we will be able to mitigate it. In, in fact, we're becoming a model for other districts in our county are following and utilizing our own process towards their reductions. Next slide. Um, in the current year, we did utilize reserves as well as the OPEB payment to push the problem into next year. Next year, we did a combination of reductions as well as a second year of the OPEB. All expenditures um, for the current year up to January 31st were entered into Munis and on the reports. The multi-year projection has been updated. In fact, since the last time we posted it, there was a mistake in the first second interim where we had continued the one-time special ed preschool grant into previous years and we removed that. Thank you, Mr. Panis, for noticing that in your questions. And so many of your questions were revised into this report. Ne next slide. Um, the budget assumptions, again, it's only as of January 31st. We have not made out year adjustments based on the current state. We did reduce revenue based on AB 602, which is our special ed. We did utilize the fund 17 transfer for the current year. And we did include the audit adjustment that was presented to the board in January, where we had reconciliation issues with property tax that increased our fund balance. All of those changes were made in the first interim, next slide. And so you can see that our deficit spending for the current year was removed because we brought in those other pieces. We, we still spend $36 million more, but you can see the beginning balance drops from 45 million down to 8 million because of the change. We have that structural deficit that we need to address in 2021 that has not been attributed in our multi-year projection. Those cuts that were approved by the board in the last couple of board meetings are not reflected yet in the multi-year that you see here. So it looks worse than it is. At this point, we will be able to close the books in 2021 with a 3% um, reserve based on the actions the board have taken to this point, and we would still need to make cuts for the 21-22 school year during next school year's progress. Going to slide seven, please. Um, as we talk about the calendar of events, we're continuing to work on MOUs. At the last board meeting, we approved two of them. We hope to, in one of the next two meetings, approve MOUs with SSA and Teamsters. It's slightly different with classified, with classified, you bargain the impact of reductions versus the actual reduction. We are recommending a second interim qualified certification. We are waiting for more information from the state. Normally, we'd be waiting for the May revise for the governor the first week of May, by May 10th, to provide an update of the state's budgetary situation. That's usually based on the, prop, the income tax receipts that come in during the month of April. Because income taxes have been pushed until July 15th, there likely will not be an updated budget in May. Where What we're hearing right now is the state is gonna do what's called a workload budget. 
Simply put, they're not gonna add anything new. They're just going to project what they believe might be the revenues and then come back in the middle of August after those July receipts and revise the budget. What that means for us is very similar to last year. In June, we provided, the, the district provided a budget that had several placeholders that weren't understood for what the expenses were gonna truly be until we came back on September 14th and presented the board with our actual structural deficit. Unfortunately, because of the COVID-19 and the state revenue issues, we're very likely gonna be in a situation where we're not gonna know our true budget for next year until we're two to three months into next year. So our, our intent is we're not adding any additional revenue. We likely will reduce the COLA at second interim slightly to protect the district, or at third interim, slightly to protect the district from any downfall. The state does have over 17 billion in reserves, so they do have the ability to mitigate a loss in revenue by utilizing, just as we did in the current year, reserves one time. So we hope to have slightly better information for the third interim, but that is also the actuals as of March 31st, and not a lot had changed on March 31st. So we'll continue to provide updates to the board and the community on what may be the budget, but unfortunately we anticipate that it's gonna be hazy at best for information for a little while. We do need to, in June, adopt an LCAP and the budget. Both of them very likely are gonna be very similar to rollover with the expectation that we'll come back in September and readopt an LCAP and a budget based on new upcoming information. Slide eight is we're continuing to work with our associations and we'll be glad to answer any questions we can on the second interim. Our recommendation based on all factors is to approve the second interim, which is the actuals as of January 31st, as a qualified certification so we can submit to the county and meet the deadline of April 10th. Thank you, Dr. Wold. Thank you for the presentation. Do we have any public comment? There is no public comment on this item. Thank you, Mr. Walton. Uh, board members, do you have any comments or questions? And I see that we have student trustee uh, Vasquez Fumala with us as well today. Thank you for joining us. Trustee Panas and Trustee Phillips, I see that your mics are are on, Trustee Panas and then Trustee Phillips. Okay, thank you. I've got a few questions here. Thank you very much for your presentation, Dr. Wold. Um, how much have we paid out of OPEB so far this year and how much more will we be paying? So we will pay by the end of the year 15.6 million. We pay as you go, so it's a month by month basis. And so, so far we've paid just under half, just over half of that in the current year, it'll be 15.6. Next year it'd be 15.8. Okay, thank you. Um, on five, page five of the executive summary, uh, we had a big, we had a 1% drop in our unduplicated count between, uh, for the current year, 1% drop Was there anything particular that led to that large drop, now a 1% drop in between our January and our, uh, our December and our March, I'm oh, sorry, October and January statements? That there were several factors. In October, we were using a projection, which is basically a rollover. We are funded on a three-year average of unduplicated counts. So if you have a large drop, you still get the three-year rolling average. The reasons we believe that we had a drop are, there are several factors to it. We moved to an online reporting system that not all of our 
stakeholders were fully understanding and able to complete. We think one of the offsets of having to go to this online world now is I think everybody's gonna be much more used to online in the future, but that didn't help us in our reporting last year. The second thing is there's confusion between those that are provisioned to schools, which are not required to do any data collection for five years because all students receive free and reduced lunch, and those that are non-provisioned to that have to do income verification, not lunch verification, which confused some of our stakeholders and so made it a little difficult. In addition, our high schools, notoriously, those students don't want to get them returned there. And then finally, they're actually, prior to COVID-19, the economy was booming. And what was occurring is many of our folks were incoming out of being eligible for the um, threshold for free and reduced lunch. And so all of those factors together created that 1% decrease. We, um, Tracy Logan, Barbara Jellison, and myself are going to be forming a task force in the next by the end of this month to look at how we can do a much better job of getting collection for next year. So that again, that one year blip wouldn't impact this as much as we go back to the three year average. Okay, thank you. Um, you noted the, I, the, that you had corrected uh, slide six on the multi-year projection to account for the preschool thing. The state forums weren't adjusted, which means the state forums don't agree with, with that now. Correct, because that wasn't done as of January 31st. The state forms in the third interim will be corrected, and we talked to the county about that. Okay. Um, so, I mean, that I, we don't have to argue about it, but to me, it seems odd like there was an error in the forms, but we can't correct it. Okay. I also noticed that um, in the executive summary, it notes that our um, unduplicated percentage for next year goes from 73% to 70.5%. And I don't notice a corresponding drop in our LCFF revenue. I didn't feel like I did between the first and the second interim. It, it would be affected for the subsequent year in the MYP. And again, it's a three-year rolling average. So it's a slightly different calculation than the actual percentage. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, Let's see. When I look at um, the uh, multi the, the the cash form in the state forms, um, it we had when I look at <clears throat> July, August, September, October of 2019 in the first interim and the second interim statement. I see that our cash decreased by more than $30 million, meaning we had a negative cash balance in some of those months. So why did those cash, I mean, the board certified the first interim and here we have very large cash balance, a huge cash balance differences between the first and interim second for the same periods. So, so cash is slightly different. It's based on when the, uh, apportionment comes from the state of California and big apportionment months are in July and December. So you tend to draw down cash right at the start of the school year. Um, this is something that we'll be evaluating more closely now that the state is probably going to have a cash crunch. The district has the ability to do what's called interfund borrowing. And as long as there's cash in multiple funds, you can cross back and forth and it doesn't create a board action or a need to do that if it's short term. The only time that it becomes long term is if you're gonna cross a fiscal year or you don't have cash in all of your funds. At that point, the district would have to go back into either borrowing from the county treasury or doing a trans. This is something that was occurring when the state started doing deferrals in 2008, nine and 10. We haven't seen that issue right now. There's been sufficient cash on hand 
across all of our district funds within the county treasury to, to not have to take an action, even though it looks weird when you look at the report. Okay, did any of that cash come out of the building fund or did it come out of other funds? No, it just comes out of other funds within the district. But I mean, I mean, and, and none of the cash it. gets, um, none of the cash actually goes away. It, it's not where you're taking money from the bond and losing interest in the bond. None of that occurs in that fashion. That's a great question though, for the public to understand. Okay, I'm wondering if the multi-year projection reflects any of the $7 million reallocation uh, commitments that the board made when it passed the AASAT resolution? It does not. As you remember, the direction from the board was for us to look within the current operational budget on what may or may not be able to be shifted. So had we added $7 million, we would have had to add to the cuts, and that was not the direction that the board gave us. I, I don't think that's the direction of Dr. Wald, I think the board said they want to take existing allocations, not add $7 million. We want to reallocate existing funds to better support our African-American students. But what you're saying is that the multi-year projection does not reflect any of that. Well, because a reallocation is the same expenditure. It's just a matter of identifying which funds within that expenditure are going to go to what action. So well, it wouldn't be an additional seven million. It would just be the same seven million spent in a different way. That's so it wouldn't be in the would MYP. Be, it would be this well, I mean it would be in the MYP or would be one of the other supporting schedules because we have a lot of detail in some of our schedules going forward. And I'm not seeing any changes that reflect that magnitude. Okay. We've talked about that enough. Um, so one more question here on, on slide six. When I look at the reserve for economic uncertainties for, 2019, for 2019 through 2020, 2020 through 21, and 2021 through 22, the reserve for economic certainties does not equal 3% of our expected expenses. And also, the fund 17 balance stays exactly the same those three years, which just could never be the case. So fund 17 is where the 3% remains. The, un, the fund balance that you're looking at is the excess above the 3% that's sitting in fund 17. What we did is we transferred the 6% over from fund 17 in the current year, left fund 17 as a static 3%, give or take a little bit of rounding so that we didn't have to add a dollar or subtract a dollar year to year. And then what you're seeing is any fall through that's above the 3% would fit within the unrestricted general fund. Um, I'm not seeing it right now, but, but is, is, is slide six being displayed right now? Because it shows $14 million. Um, I just, I'm not convinced it's the right number then why it should be exactly the same for three years in a row. Um, We'll go back and look at why I think part of the challenge is because Fund 17 is separate. Once we made the decision to put our balance over there, it doesn't reconcile in the forms. We may want to consider not leaving funds in Fund 17 so that it's all in one place and it shows up on the forms better. So let staff go back and look at whether that's a better, more transparent methodology to make the numbers add up more correctly. Okay, thank you. That's the end of my questions for now, President Janisar. Thank you, Trustee Bonas. Um, Trustee Phillips? Yes, thank you very much. Um, so first, I want to uh, echo what Trustee Panis just said. Um, what I recall the direction from the board being uh, was to take monies uh, that are being spent currently and to $7 million worth. Um, understanding that there are some monies already being spent on that, but to take that money and to reallocate it uh, to services for African-American students. Um, and what the board also uh, directed staff to do was to include um, that work in ongoing future uh, budget sheets, worksheets, uh, like what we're doing, reports, and like what we're doing tonight. Uh, that hasn't been done. 
Um, and my concern, frankly, uh, is that uh, staff is waiting us out and that uh, it's not going to be done. And then in June, we are going to get uh, a budget to vote on and it's not going to include what we asked. Um, now, I know you guys wouldn't do anything like that because you're all, uh, you know, on the square, but uh, that's how I'm beginning to feel. Like this is really just a waiting game and, you know, give the board the presentations. Uh, and then when uh, time comes in June, uh, they will be forced to vote on uh, a budget that doesn't include uh, the asset allocations, uh, the asset allocations that the board directed. Um, I don't know if anybody else is feeling like that, but that's how I'm feeling. Um, and that's not good. So uh, please uh, follow the direction of the board and begin to include uh, those allocations and the discussions and the presentations that you bring to us because that's what we asked you to do. And I believe we asked you to do it unanimously. Um, the second thing, uh, this is for Dr. Wold. Um, you were talking about the cross fund transfers. Can you talk about that a little more, please? So add, all of before, uh, Mr. Wold does that, you know, we wouldn't see what you are referring to in this type of presentation. So for example, the initial ask was that that $7 million be part of the supplemental concentration dollars, um, none of which we've brought to the board yet for the 2021 school year. Um, so that's 50 to $60 million that has to get sorted out um, with, um, with the budget. So just to be clear, um, the multi-year projection that you're seeing in the second interim is in, it's a very high level presentation and doesn't get into the details of what we're spending within all of the funds, including supplemental concentration. So um, those details are what we're all working on along with the layoffs and everything else right now. So just wanted to be clear about it. Thank you. Uh, just to the extent that you, you can, um, and I know that you can, uh, please, um, please include that information uh, for us because what's happening right now, because we, we understand as well that if we're going to add money, it's, it's a zero sum game, but if we're going to add money uh, to services for African American students, that that money has to come from somewhere. Um, in other words, you could call it a cut. Um, you know, it is, it is what it is. The money has to come from somewhere, so it has to be cut from somewhere and moved. Um, and so while we're having these discussions about cuts, all of these discussions that we've been having, they've been about cuts. Um, but none of the discussions have included cuts to cover the reallocation for African American students. So I think that's why, even though this may be a high level discussion, uh, you know, or a 30,000 foot discussion, we are actually talking about uh, the cuts that we need to make to balance things out. And so there's no reason that that can't be, and when I say that, I'm talking about the ASAP resolution, why that cannot be part of the discussion, because that's exactly what we're talking about right now, um, cuts. Uh, so we can reallocate things to do what we need to do. Uh, but the cross fund, Dr. Wolk, can you talk about that cross fund transfers? So all of the district funds sit in the county treasury in a single dollar amount, whether it's fund one, fund 13, fund 11, fund 12, all of the different funds sit there, including fund 40, which is our own facilities fund. So we have the ability to draw on one fund or another within reason, as long as the fund is restored within that same period of time to make a payroll without having to take a loan if one fund is negative for one month while you're waiting for an apportionment to come. So it's just a natural thing done in the county treasury as long as the sum balance is fine at each interim. You, you don't worry about the cash flow as you're waiting because you've already booked the due twos for property tax in there. And so fund balance is covered. It just happens to be a cash. Where you run into issues is if you run out of cash in fund one completely and no ability to transfer from other funds 
in the short term while you're waiting for property tax to come in on December where you already have a due to booked against it. So I'm gonna do the same thing that I did with Mr. Freeze and just try to put this in layman's terms. So this is kind of like, uh, you said a period of time. So you could borrow it for a period of time, right? Right, and just then, within, think of it like your checkbook. The simplest way to put it is, you today have $3,000 in your savings and 1,000 in your checking and your $2,000 mortgage is due and you know you're getting paid in two weeks. So you transfer from the savings, the $2,000 to cover your mortgage, you then restore your savings right when your paycheck comes in in two, month, in, in two weeks. That, that's probably the simplistic example. Okay, um, and another way would be like borrowing from your 401k if you had one, you gotta put it back by a certain period of time. Yeah, it's a little less complex than that because there's consequences to borrowing from your 401k, your, paying penalties, there's no penalties in this sense. It's more like savings and checking, going back and forth. Okay, so not saying that you all are doing this, but these are interesting times and we are in fiscal trouble. Um, not that we've done anything wrong, we just have some fiscal issues. Maybe that's a better way to put it. Um, conceivably, and if I'm wrong, just say no, you're wrong, but conceivably, um, we could keep doing this, right? Like jumping from fund to fund uh, for things to balance, um, but never really having all of our funds. I know right now things are fine because that's what you said. There's sufficient cash in all of the funds, but theoretically we could take from fund A and, and transfer to fund B, so fund B is right, and then go back to fund A, and we, we could just keep going forever like a shell. No, if we, the answer is no. no, we cannot do that. The county would immediately step in if we showed, a. that's basically a shell game of doing right. things, and that is fiscal mismanagement. If we run into a cash situation where we are not whole within our own base revenue, then we would be declared negative. And so the answer is absolutely no. Under any circumstance, can we play that game? This is very much a month to month situation within the same month. If we had to go beyond that, beyond several months there, then we would be looking at doing what's called a trans or a borrowing an actual loan from the, from the county treasury where we have to pay basis points of interest. And we have not had to do that yet. Back in 2009, 10 and 11, there was borrowing because the state did not fund us correctly. And that is done through resolution. The board has to approve that. So to answer your question, no, that is not possible. There's no way that staff could do that. The county checks over our shoulder to make sure that we don't do that. And that's one of the big red flags they watch. Okay, so, but if we did what you're calling the trans, the transfer or a loan, that's, those two things would require the board to take action, correct? Absolutely, board, formal board resolution must be done to borrow for cash because you are short from what the state is providing in their apportionments. But when you were talking about these cross fund transfers, I thought you said, and I know this is, these are three different things, the loan, the trans, and then the, the cross fund transfers. Uh, now I'm on the cross, back on the cross fund transfers. I thought you said that the staff can do those transfers without board approval. Correct, because this has to do with, you already have a note from the state on when they're gonna pay you your apportionment. So you know you've got the guaranteed cash. It's just a timing issue. Very okay. different than you don't have the cash from the state. So you already have guaranteed revenue to cover that transfer. So it's a very different methodology. And, and we're, we're deep, deep, deep in the weeds right now to, to this. There's no, there's no concern with cash today. There, I am concerned, however, about the state's ability to apportion in the future. And I would not be surprised at all in fiscal 2021 that we may see some deferrals and may see the need for the board to take action to do borrowing. So I've already asked our staff to do monthly cash projections 
that if we start to see a negative trend, I'm gonna bring those to the board so that you're aware long before we have to borrow. So my, so that, all of that, what you just said, built up to um, what I was about to say. Uh, with the current fiscal situation of the district, um, I personally, and you know, the other board members, I don't know how they feel, but um, maybe they could chime in. Um, even though staff has the ability to transfer monies, and I know this has happened before, but even though staff has the ability to transfer monies basically back and forth between funds without us knowing, um, I want to know when you guys are doing that. Okay. Um, so I, I'm aware, and I wouldn't be surprised if the other board members want to know that uh, as well. So if that is going to happen, whether it's in a Friday memo, whether it's in a superintendent's report, I understand maybe sometimes things have to happen expeditiously. Uh, but anytime you guys are, you know, transferring money back and forth between funds, um, I, I want to know. We'll, we'll be glad to do that. That's good practice. Thank you, Dr. Walden. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Phillips, thank you for your comment. Um, I would just like to see, uh, to have other board members share their thoughts on this very briefly. Trustee <laughs> Um, thank you, um, board and staff. I just want to say that uh, some of the flexibility that we're utilizing is flexible. Trustee Cuevas, I can't hear you. We lost you. <laughs> Having negative debt. And that was part of what went hand in hand with relaxing some of the categoricals during that time as well, which was mainly lifting restrictions on the use of those dollars. So is, it's, is it true, Mr. Wold, that that's pretty much uh, what we're talking about here, which is basically uh, trying to um, just basically use the dollars that we know are coming in that are promised encumbered, so to speak, to be able to be used in a way so that um, we have that flexibility because the only way you get out of debt when you're in a crunch is to have as maximum flexibility to be able to use your dollars where you need them appropriately. Um, and the other thing is, is that I do think it is good practice to go ahead and, and share with us when that's happening, but it is absolutely impossible to play that game uh, over and over because you still have to get your budget certified every year by the county. And the county would know very quickly that you've run out of money. And eventually, that's a pyramid scheme. You run out of money. You can't keep doing that uh, over and over again when the well dries up. So that is completely illegal. I don't see any evidence of that here uh, in any way. And I just want to make sure we're clear that folks know that part of what our challenges are is the lack of resource coming in from the state uh, and an increased expectation of costs. Um, so I do support the staff in terms of utilizing all of those mechanisms to balance our budget. We've been doing that. I do want to go back to the notion, though, of the $7 million, um, basically, uh, apportionment that we've asked you to work into the budget. Uh, my, under, my assessment, and folks might disagree, is that the majority of that is tied up in terms of how we're going to have to move that money around in staff. And so that needs to be added to negotiation conversations and even start in my mind an on ramp to that when you start, we're looking at revamping some of our job positions. There's no reason why looking at how to staff dollars get used to support that $7 million uh, mandate that we've asked you to incorporate. You need to start revving up to that. You need to start getting our bargaining units ready for that because that is really where the chunk of money is to move around without adding additional expense. We've made it clear we don't want to add additional expense. We can, we're already operating the deficit. We do wanna uh, use the resources and have them appropriated in a way that makes sense. And the majority of our budget is tied up in people. So what people do in their jobs to support that mandate is probably a discussion that you're gonna start to start having with our bargaining units. Um, and I would rev up towards that. The ultimate, ultimate opportunity to do that will be when you renegotiate with all those unions, when bargain um, agreements, bargaining agreements come up again. So that's a note to our uh, bargaining units as well. Many of you have been coming to us and saying, we wanna put equity first, we wanna put equity first. Well, there will be an opportunity now where all the infrastructure will align to make that real. 
that's where the real systemic, to me, the real systemic change is going to be with marrying the intention with the budget opportunity and the actual rules we work within to make it happen. Um, without that, though, I think that um, we've done a tremendous job. This community, this um, our school communities, we've we've tightened our belt in ways that we can never imagine. Now we do know that it will be even more difficult without the budget forecasting of what the implications of this unexpected pandemic is gonna have on it. But that will be the hard part moving forward. How are we still gonna do what we intended to do, which is serve our students, serve our most vulnerable students, and maybe even having less money to do it. That's my projection, it will be a reality and the only way to maximize getting the most of these intentions to become real will be when you have all the tools and a completed opening bargaining opportunity to do that. And that's coming up. Once that window closes, then we definitely will be locked out of being able to utilize those dollars significantly and how the board has asked. And so I'd ask you to please start revving up those conversations. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Cuevas. Trustee Lara, do you have anything to share? Uh, yes, I do. And, um, you know, this is not uh, business as usual. We have mentioned that before. And I am constantly thinking about the future uh, and the financial impact that this pandemic is going to have on all of us. And I seriously believe that we all need to prepare ourselves for even more cuts. Serious, more cuts, seriously, more than we've experienced, even with this deficit. That's what I feel. And I'm just hoping that we all understand that and everybody really prepares yourself emotionally that this is going to happen. I, I, I just don't see any other, um, anything else happening. It's not like money's not going to fall from the sky. So uh, to prepare ourselves. When I, um, Dr. Wold, you talked about we might not know until the second month of next year what what our budget is for next year. And I was wondering if we find out, for instance, that there's serious uh, cuts in our in our budget, would we then have to make those cuts mid-year, or would we be able to go through the whole school year? So that, that's still up in the air. Our belief is, and what I've been talking with a lot of the state lawmakers, that we are in a sense too big to fail. We may get at best a status quo, which means we won't get any additional dollars. We'll get approximately what we had this year. That's less than we anticipated. So that would mean that we would need to use some reserves and have greater cuts in the next year. If I were a betting person, I would say that I'm going to have no assurance to give to the board in May or June on what our budget is. And I'm going to be asking the board to basically approve nothing with the expectation that we're going to come back in September and do a revised budget at that point. Once the state gives us true information, we're then going to conserve each and every dollar we possibly can to prepare for the possibility of a reduction in the mid-year that requires additional cuts. All of our bargaining units contracts open next year. So as, as Trustee Cueva said, we'll start those conversations with them earlier rather than later as we have more information. Um, there is, if the state does not provide a 2% increase, there's statute that allows an additional certificated layoff after August that may come into effect. There may be mitigation factors that we have to do, but I think we should be prepared just like this year. We didn't really know what we were doing until September 14th. It's very likely it's gonna be a similar situation, not through the fault of this board, not through the fault of this community, just the true facts that COVID-19 has changed the way we do business. We're not gonna have the information that we've anticipated having. Nothing's the same. The assembly just came out today with a notice that they don't think they're gonna be able to do budget as usual. So that just came out of the California Assembly's office. And so I anticipate that each of my 
updates to the board is going to be wait and see, wait and see. At the same time, we're going to continue to try to do each of the things you're asking, give that transparent data, make sure that we squire away as whatever we can in reserves and limit our ongoing liability so that we don't have new cuts that we create on our own, that the only cuts that get created are because the state's taking action. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Trustee Lara. Thank you, Dr. Wold. Um, I wanted to follow up on, on the question that uh, Trustee Panas and uh, Trustee Phillips and Trustee uh, Cuevas also uh, mentioned in regards to the, the $7 million. I, I think, I mean, I looked up the resolution right now again from our January 15th meeting, I believe. And it's very specific, you know, where these uh, funds were going to be, are going to be uh, going to. and. I just, I think that we were really clear when we passed this unanimously that we're not asking to um, add an additional $7 million to the deficit. I think it was very clear that we had asked for the funds to be reallocated from the existing um, funds already. And, and just, I think that we need to have a really um, genuine conversation and understand. I know I know that uh, Dr. Wold, I think you mentioned that this is a high level um, report and, and the sheets are very uh, complex, but I think that it's important that we make it clear to the community that we are not using that as a way to excuse not having the information on hand when it's necessary. And I think that I would love for the board to have follow up because I heard, uh, you know, several trustees talk about just the need to have more clarity on that process and and where and when and, and where we're, we're going to see the supplemental and concentration grant uh, money um, explained and i know that those are smaller details but they're just as important as the other details included in the presentation and in the documents attached so if, i think I, I really would like for um, mr duffy and uh, dr wolf to follow up with the board because i'm hearing that from the rest of the board that we want more clarity on this process and we want more clarity around specifically our um, asset resolution that we passed in January and what that's going to look like before we get the budget um, in June. And Madam President, can I add one more thing real quick to your comment? Yeah. Um, the thing that's troubling for me is that it can't just be all supplemental and concentration and we're gonna figure out how that addresses it because the reality is, is we're a high, uh, um, um, the unduplicated pupil district. So the, we're getting a lot of those funds and not enough basic um, dollars out of LCFF to cover just the general basic needs of the district. So you're gonna have to figure out how to incorporate those two things. Um, they're not separate for us. Most of our money is still one pot, whether it comes at LCFF Trustee Cuevas, you froze and I don't hear your audio anymore. Does anybody else hear the audio? No? Okay. Trustee Cuevas? Uh, and address these gaps that we're asking you to do and still figure out how to keep the lights on at the same time because there's no separation in that set of students. There's not enough. If you were to save in $7 million out of supplemental and concentration and I would identify it, well, we used all those dollars. What do we use it for? We use it for staff and for programs. And sometimes those dollars are filling in gaps where district dollars can't, at the central level, can't cover things. So, so my advice and uh, hope for you all is that you figure how do we do that with the dollars we have? And to me, that is about a culture shift on what our expectations on how we're performing work. The majority of those dollars, even those supplemental and concentration dollars, are still, for the most part, tied up in staff. Is that correct, Mr. Wald? That, that is correct. So we, we will um, huddle and see if we can't create some level of report to show what, what we've already identified is going towards that target and where we think additional shifts can go within, a, a, as we said, it doesn't show up in this report, but Mr. Duffy and I had actually begun that conversation this afternoon. So we'll continue to look at what we can bring forward. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Cuevas. 
And we haven't heard yet from our student trustees, and I see that trustee, student trustee Rydell joined us right now. Um, if student trustee Somala Vasquez or student trustee Rydell have any comments or questions, um, please, right now would be a great time. Student trustee Rydell, I see that you have your mic on. Um, student trustee Rydell, it sounds like the microphone is not very clear. Ms. Logan, does uh, student trustee Rydell still show, show up? I don't see her at the moment. Um, maybe we could move on and I'll, I'll search for her and see if we can get her back. Thank you. Uh, student trustee Vasquez Womala. Hi, student trustee Vasquez Womala. I can't hear you. Um, I'm not sure if anybody else can hear. There Hello, you can you guys hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is this is still the same one with the um, seven million for African Americans, right? Yes. That, yeah. Yeah. So I mean, that's the from from all of this. That's the the part that I get the that I understand the most. The other part I'd probably have to like talk to you guys individually to understand fully. Um, but for the African American part, that part I do understand. Um, and I don't know. I think. My saying all this is I think as long as we all understand that setting some money aside to help the African-American community um, and we're all on the same page about doing that and we are all trying to do that, I think then I'm, I'm pretty, I'm good with that. Because um, I think it is important that we all do understand that the African-American uh, community does need a little bit more attention than maybe some of the other ones. And that I think one way of doing that is yeah, I mean, you have to give them more resources and try and give them more help. Um, and this is this has obviously been a problem for a long time. And it's something that I see a lot in my school um, and my friends and stuff. Uh, it's like a lot of most of my friends are white friends and Asian friends. And I think it's not just because African Americans choose not to be smart or choose because uh, choose to be this way or choose not to. I don't know. It's just. It's because of the resources and I think so spending this money and trying to get this part figured out is something that's important to me and I think that will help us in the long run a lot and it's something that just needs to be done. So this is a good conversation we're having and the 7 million should definitely be something that is executed and that should be used and kept towards that cause. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, student trustee Vasquez Mamala. Thank you. We can't hear you, student trustee Riddell. We see that you're present. Can you turn up your mic or get it closer to your phone or computer? We hear you very faintly. You sound very far away. Yeah. Still really far away. If it's because you have your earbuds in, pull out the earbuds um, from your tablet because that's my problem. That's why they couldn't hear me. Yeah, I still cannot hear student trustee right now. Is there any way, um, Ms. Logan, for um, you or Mr. David to follow up with student trustee Rydell via email or um, the chat to see if you can help her figure out the mic? Sure. Yeah, we've got the, the chat turned off, um, but okay. student trustee Riddell will email you now and figure out how we can get you better connected. Maybe you can call in instead. 
Great. Thank you so much, Ms. Logan. And we'll hear from you soon, uh, student trustee Rydell. Thank you. So uh, board members, we've had a lot of conversation on this uh, agenda item, and I wanted to know if uh, there is a motion um, on the floor, if anybody would like to make a motion. President Anders Jarvis, I'll make a motion. Uh, I have a little more to say here. So last time we had a conversation about a negative certification. And I'd just like to point out that um, <clears throat> the last three interim budget reports from Sacramento City School District have been negative and they're not in receivership. The last two from Sweetwater Union High School District have been negative and they're not in receivership. This, this happens all the time. Uh, just because you have a negative certification doesn't mean you go into receivership. Um, when I look at these numbers, they're not all adding up. And, you know, we had, to me, uh, we certified numbers last time and actually they were wrong because they didn't include properly reflected loans. And actually, I, maybe we can reasonably we can disagree on this. When I look at it, code, 42603, it says the board is supposed to approve transfers between funds, even temporary. So um, I'm moving, and I'm not doing this because I think it's fun. I just think when I look at the numbers, they say to me, there's a real chance we're not gonna be meeting our obligations at the end of the next fiscal year. So I'm gonna move, we have a negative certification. Thank you, Trustee Panos. I just want to register my total opposition to that statement for the record. Um, also, just so that the board is aware, um, the reason both Sacramento City and Sweetwater are negative is they were in very different situations. Their unions were not actively working towards solutions. They were in a very different scenario. Sweetwater indeed may have had some fraud involved in the way they did their budget, which we don't have. Also at Sacramento City, there is very contentious negotiations with their labor unions and they weren't sure that they were able to get any solutions and they still haven't. We are in a very different situation. A negative certification, Mr. Panis is correct, does not mean we're in receivership, but it does put us precariously on that fence. It also, eliminates last board meeting, you approved the ability to go out and sell bonds to save taxpayers money. We go negative, we can't sell bonds. We can't sell measure T, measure our bonds without a higher premium. That creates a challenge. Madam Chair, can I have the floor please? Yes. Um, so I see Mr. Panis's point, but I do think it's, 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 it's a one plate that's spinning with that perspective. And like anything, I can find a true statement if I take it in isolation. Uh, at the same time, I think for us to consider a negative certification would be completely disrespectful and a slap in the face to the community and our stakeholders that have worked very hard to go through the pain of making cuts, to go through the pain of doing what we are doing to get out in front of the issue and voting negative would also to me disproportionately place the implications of what the COVID uh, uh, economics uh, impact is going to be on our district. And we don't know that yet. And we certainly aren't the ones to blame for what the economic impact is going to be of this world pandemic. So I just think that I see the point, Mr. Panis, but I've got to weigh it with all the other points of information that are available to me. Now, if this district was evidence of clear financial mismanagement by itself, and there was a sense of no community working together to take the pain of the cuts we've had to make, and at the same time, knowing that uh, anything we've done to not generate, demonstrate our own generosity with passing parcel taxes and passing uh, bond efforts, then I could say, yes, this community is in fact setting itself up to take some blame for why we have budget shortfalls. And I'm not saying we don't have any, 
but I'm not going to overstate what our fault is when we've done everything we can to control it. When what you're talking about would be a complete demonstration that I've got to take responsibility for what the state's impact of how they're going to dole money out in response to COVID next year. Because that's a projection that I can make come true if I really want to state it to say a certain way. We're not going to make our bills next year. I could find a million ways to say and prove that that's going to happen uh, if I, all I have to do is say, well, look at what we know the impact of the COVID impact is going to be. But it's the district that will bear the way. And I think that's disproportionate. So I will not be supporting a negative, um, a negative qualification um, motion right now because we've worked too hard. We've worked too hard over the last, once we became aware, self-awareness is the key to change. Once we became aware, we moved. We moved as hard as we could. We've sat here and we've seen administrators We lost you. Um, Chelsea Cuevas, we cannot hear you. Well, a negative certification. Chelsea Cuevas, we could not hear the very last part of what you uh, said. It broke off for like 10 seconds. I just said, I, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? I, I just said, I, I will not, um, I will not turn my back on all the hard work and self-directed sacrifice that all our stakeholders have made to have us address our budget deficits in every way we possibly could control by deciding all of a sudden I'm going to vote for a negative certification. I think that would be um, very disrespectful and unwarranted and not a true representation of how hard Thank you, Trustee Cuevas. So there is a motion that was made by uh, Trustee Panas. Uh, Trustee Lara, I see your mic is on. No, I'll wait, I'll wait. Is there, is there a second for Trustee Panas' motion? Okay, so it looks like there is no second. I'd like to make a motion. Is that uh, Trustee Lara? Yeah. It's me. I would like to recommend the approval of the second interim report with a qualified budget certification. Motion made by uh, Trustee Lara to approve the second interim report for the 2019-2020 with a qualified budget certification. Is there a second? This is Trustee Panos. I'll second Trustee Phillips seconds uh, Trustee Lara's motion. Uh, board members, can we please have a vote and have you state your name before your vote? Phillips, yes. Panos, no. Trustee, um, board, Madam Chair, I, I missed some of it. I'm sorry, I was having a problem with my earphones. We're voting on a um, motion. See, uh, yes, uh, Trustee Lara made a motion uh, to a approve the second interim report for 2019-2020 with a qualified budget certification, uh, trustee. Um, okay, uh, trustee Cuevas votes yes. Lara, yes. And I'm yeah, in myself, trustee uh, Hernandez Jarvis, yes. So the motion passes uh, four, one, zero, zero with trustee Panas voting no. Thank you, board, and thank you, Trustee Panas, uh, for your comments as well, and thank you, Trustee Cuevas, as well. That leads us to the next action item in our agenda, which is item D5, resolution number 83-1920, appointing the Citizens Bond Oversight Committee for General Obligation Bonds authorized pursuant to Measure R. So, Thank you, President Hernandez Jarvis. This is a formality with measure O, with measure R being certified, the district has 60 days to appoint a citizens bond oversight committee. We already have a citizens bond oversight committee. We are not recommending, and there was some confusion in how this was written. We are not recommending any changes whatsoever to the current CBOC. We um, have currently 17 
members of which there are only, um, there's only seven active with the vacancy listed. We didn't list the other positions. That was an oversight because they had been vacant prior to the resignation of Greg Visenow. And so unfortunately when bond council revised this, they just took the current configuration, but all of the members that are in the bylaws are still part of the CBOC. In fact, we need to continue to recruit. Uh, Louis Fries, myself and Don Gosney did meet last a couple weeks ago to for, um, have a conversation about the revision of bylaws that we still need to bring back to the board. That'll happen in its own course of action and district and CBOC we believe are aligned to be able to support those together as we move forward. So tonight's resolution is really just certifying the election, stating that our current CBOC will also oversee Measure R, which is required by law. Um, in there, it also has a whereas that this will be entered into the minutes. What that means is once you certify with your vote that we put in the minutes that you have certified with your vote, the election results. So this is just a formality. It really is a simple consent item, but we wanted to be very transparent and bring it forward publicly so that the board could certify it. At the next meeting, we plan to do a celebration for the fact that we were able to pass Measure R during these times and all of the great help that's gonna be for our community. So with that, we would ask that you certify the election with your vote. Thank you, Dr. Wald. Um, are there any um, uh, comments or questions from the board? Ms. Lara, there are two um, public comments, or excuse me, there's one now. Oops, sorry. Uh, yes, any public comments? Uh, yes, uh, Don Gosney, go ahead and un unmute yourself and you have three minutes to speak. Thank you very much. You know, when the agenda first came out, my concerns were mostly twofold. I was mostly concerned that the inclusion of Exhibit A, which is only a partial list of the CBOC positions, was an attempt by staff to circumvent Board Policy 7214.2 and cut nine positions from the CBOC. Exhibit A's failure to even mention the nine other vacant positions was obvious to those of us on the CBOC. The second concern had to do with the claim that the certified results of the election had been announced at a board meeting and were included in the minutes when they were very clearly, this was not correct. I'm pleased that Dr. Wold and Louis Fries both reached out to me via email and phone to assuage my concerns. As long as we have assurances from the board that this is not an effort to abrogate your own board policy with regards to the CVOC, I have no further problems. It may be minor, but this has opened up another concern because it's something that keeps recurring. Oh, and by the way, the last resolution for a bond passed in 2012, 2012, I'm sorry, there was no exhibit A in the resolution. Okay, but our board council will never be confused with a strip mall law firm. Nixon Peabody is a well-respected, and that's why they can charge us more than $400 per hour for their associate attorneys. Considering that we really don't have any loose change to throw away, it worries me that we're pay paying mega bucks for a resolution that has been so poorly drafted and does not reflect the realities of our CBOC. This, if it had it been properly drafted, we wouldn't even be having this discussion right now. This is the same concern we've been raising over the extremely expensive letter they wrote telling the board why most of the proposed amendments to the board policy should be rejected. This was another opinion from our bond council that was full of errors and should never have been proffered by our, by our bond council. Considering that the last two opinions coming from Nixon Peabody have been suspect, I would hope that our elected trustees would give pause before considering anything on their letterhead and I would hope that our senior staff would give pause before making a choice between laying off another teacher or paying for a flawed Nixon Peabody opinion. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Gosney, and thank you, Justice Lara, for um, stepping in to facilitate when I had to step away briefly. Board members, uh, do you President have- President Jarvis, I've got a couple comments. Yes, Trustee Panos. Um, so I noted that uh, when we passed uh, the bond in 2012, there was an item that came to the meeting on December 12, 2012, and that included a certification um, from Steve Weir, the county clerk at the time, saying that this had passed, and I believe that also happened in 2010. So normally, the staff has brought to us the certification and said, please approve this certification. I also note that in the fifth whereas, 
it says that November 7, 2000 was a Proposition 39 bond. That's factually incorrect. That was not a Proposition 39 bond. Um, and when this came last time, it actually came through the CB CBOC first, and then it came to the board. And I also, I, having exhibit, what I also saw that exhibit A was not in the uh, resolution that came to the board the last time. So I just, I think we could do some more work on this. This is not the end of the world. Mr. Gosney seems happy with it, but I just wish that, you know, we could have the official county clerk certification here in front of us and saying we're certifying that and that our resolution reflected fact. Part of it is with the COVID shutdown, we're not getting everything in the most timely manner. And so I, I beg the board's forgiveness. The board um, will also note at the facilities committee, we considered going out for RFP for bond council earlier this year. The timing wasn't right at that time for them and financial advisor. And we've been very pleased with our financial advisor. It may be time to do a new RFP for bond council. And that's something we can discuss moving forward as well. Thank you, Trustee Penas and Dr. Wold. Um, Trustee Cuevas, Trustee Phillips, Trustee Lara, do you have any questions or comments? Uh, Madam Chair, if I may. Yes. Um, there's two things I'm thinking here for me anyways. One is um, the notion that we're going to get rid or um, in the dark suspend our CBOC or try to downsize it to me is ridiculous. It's required by law, it's something we will do. We've had conversation about there's clearly a difference of opinion of what the ceiling is of how far above we go. For example, I heard somebody mention earlier, uh, CBOC wants to determine and say what our audits are. Well, I can clearly go into the language of, this, of the um, Prop 39 and doesn't say anything about CBOC determining what the audits are. So that's again an example of people's opinions. Now, if the community wants to have it, that's great. But these are some of the same folks that talked about how they didn't want to pass another bond. And clearly enough people had a different opinion and they passed one. So the reality is, is that we listen to people's opinions when it's in agreement with us and we shoot it down when it's not. And then we use these tools to say, well, who agrees with me and who doesn't? But let's talk about the facts. The facts are we will always have oversight. It is required by law. For me, the issue is going to be, let's have those conversations because there's real issues that are unique to us. Now, I, for a fact, am personally going to enact my values, and I'll show you an example. I don't plan to run for re-election. I never plan to run past two terms. Why? Because I personally believe we need to make room. We need to make space for other community members to hold leadership, to grow in their roles. The notion of people being on boards for 20 years is ridiculous to me, but that's my opinion. All I can do is act on it the way I want. But I can, in fact, push this board to also say that I think that there are some uh, reforms that are needed with our CBOC. And that, to me, means we can make the space for that. And I can make that opinion just like other people can make their opinion. I do believe we need term limits on our CBOC. I do believe that we actually need to figure out how we're growing um, impact and representation on our CBOC of local communities. The notion, again, that it's all, well, you're the district that's killing people's desire to want to be engaged in it, I think is, again, a disproportionate blame for what are the reasons why people don't participate in it. Maybe it's also the people who are on it. If you're going to go ahead and add, let's just talk about everything it could be, let's add equally what all those things could be. So for me, this is just, a, uh, and I'm willing to move this motion because we're just going to pass in our own way, a recognition that this bond measure are in fact passed and it will have oversight per the law. And don't be surprised if before I leave this board, I bring back the notion of doing some real work and it's better for us to talk about what my intention is and how we can find some way to make this work for everybody because I do believe in building things together, but we do need reform of our CBOC because this is why I think we do. At some point, even in South Africa, when you had people who had inflicted harm on each other and other people, they had a truth and reconciliation process. We will accept what happened, but then we will reconcile and move on. 
It is time, as demonstrated through our audits, through the, the leadership of this board, that we have implemented changes in our CBOs in our bond program. That is part of the truth. And I can't have this notion again that we will constantly be held by this idea that for some reason we don't have oversight and that we are running amok. It's time for some reconciliation and to move on because then we still have hard work to do and to move on with the reality of the facts. We don't have a $1.6 billion bond program anymore. We got lucky. We just passed a $575 million one. I think our CBOC needs to reflect that. And we need to shed all the past that holds us back from engaging our community in proper ways to get to the point where we're in fact having representatives. Yes, you must know your past to know where you're going in the future, but we can't be held by our past. And those who consistently insist on holding us to the limitations of our past. We need to move forward. We have schools to build and communities to serve. And so I'm happy to move this item and at the same time know that I invite and I hope that we will bring this back to discuss reform about our CBOC as a whole. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Cuevas. I would like to second that, uh, that motion. So Trustee, Trustee Cuevas, you officially uh, made the motion, right? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And Trustee Lara has seconded the motion. Um, board members, can we please have a vote? And please stay uh, here for. Trustee Cuevas, would you accept a friendly amendment to remove the November 7, 2000 bond from there? Because that was not a Proposition 39 bond. Absolutely, Trustee Panis. Thank you, Trustee Panas, and thank you, Trustee Cuevas. So now, board, can we please uh, have the vote and please state your name clearly before? Panas, yes. Cuevas, yes. Lara, yes. Yes. Phillips, you cut off when you were saying your vote. Would you mind repeating it, please? Yes. Yes, yes. Phillips. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, and Trustee Hernandez Jarvis, yes. Um, resolution number 83, 1920, appointing the Citizens Bond Oversight Committee for General Obligation Bonds authorized pursuant to Measure R passes unanimously. Thank you, Board. Thank you, Dr. Wold. And thank you, Mr. Gosney, as well for your comments. Uh, the next action item that we have on the agenda is action item D6, designation of applicants for FEMA reimbursements. Resolution 84, 1920. So this is another item that we could have brought on for consent, but based on the current situation, we felt it was very important for the community to understand that we do serve as emergency workers and provide support to the community as we've been doing at the meal service. This resolution is just allowing us to submit an application that may allow the district to get some FEMA um, monetary assistance for some of the work that we're doing. There's no determination that we'll get a single dollar, but we still want to have the application in place. We are documenting all of our costs so that as it is possible for us to get additional resources, the district will pursue those. And it requires the board to adopt the resolution to allow us to even submit an application. Thank you, Dr. Wold. Mr. Walton, do we have public comment for this item? There is no public comment on this item. Thank you. Board members, uh, do you have any comments or questions? Trustee Panis, I'll move uh, resolution 84, 1920, designation of applicants for FEMA res reimbursements. I second that. Is that Trustee Lara? Was that Trustee Lara? Yes. Yes, that was yes. Trustee Lara. Thank you. So, uh, motion made by Trustee Pana, seconded by Trustee Lara. Uh, board members, let's have a vote. Please state your name before voting. Yes. yes. Lara, yes. Trustee Phillips and Trustee Cuevas. 
Yes, Phillips, yes. Thank you. Uh, Cuevas, yes. Thank you. Hernandez Jarvis, yes. Uh, motion passes unanimously to, um, uh, I'm so sorry, to uh, approve the resolution of the designation of applicant for FEMA reimbursements, resolution 84 1920. Thank you so much, board. Thank you, Dr. Wold. With that, we conclude our action items. And up next, we have our discussion items and reports. Item E1 is a revised school calendar for 2020 2021. Thank you. So this one is being brought to the board for information. Normally, we would have done more hearings and other analysis with this. With the shutdown, it's slightly more difficult to do so. With the last couple of years, the district has been able to submit attendance waivers when we've had to shut down school due to smoke or due to electrical shutdowns which unfortunately in the fall tend to be the new normal in Northern California. Based on guidance from the Department of Education and in collaboration with all of our associations, we met to revise next year's school calendar to include what are called reserved days. If you grew up back East, you may have heard of these as snow days. They're non-student days. There's no schedule to work. They're, they're built in within the 180 day um, instructional calendar. So you still have 180 instructional days, but you have three days within where there's non-student days. So that if you had to cancel a date, you would then be able to reschedule school for one of those reserve days. If you don't have an event that requires you to cancel school, that just becomes not a holiday, just becomes a non-working day for employees there. And so looking at the schedule there, and it's not up, but I'll try to bring it up um, real quickly. We added three days in. We started the same first school day, which is the 17th of August. This is all pending COVID, allowing us to be back in school at that time. Our first reserve day would be in November there, and it was... I'm trying to find it on the calendar. Oh no, the first reserve day would be October 12th of 2020. The second reserve day would be March 26th of 2021. And the third reserve day would be May 10 of 2021. The last day of school would move to Wednesday, June 9th, 2021. Again, there's no action we're asking tonight. We'll bring it back on the 22nd for approval with those three reserve days built in. We just wanted it to be brought for board discussion tonight, as well as for the public to have time to review it and bring any comment on the 22nd. I also wanted to add that uh, this was done um, with solutions team um, with all the different labor units, as well as two of our trustees in those meetings over the course of a few months looking at um, what would be possible. Um, especially want to thank the heads of those units, including uh, teachers union, thinking about those days. So uh, just giving some context about how that got built out. And we thought three days was the most appropriate, at least to try for next year, um, being that we've missed, you know, one to two days the last two years, um, giving us that flexibility, knowing that if there's no fires, no smoke, anything that happens, we end school three days later. So with that, any discussion? Hi, um, Trustee Panas, do you have a yeah. comment? Is there any public comment? Yes, um, President Hernandez Jarvis, we do have a, one public comment. Great, thank you. Uh, Demetrio Gonzalez, go ahead and unmute yourself and you can speak. 
Good evening, school board members, Brenton and Duffy, and the and community. My name is Demetrio Gonzalez. I'm the president of United Teachers of Richmond. Um, like Mr. Duffy just mentioned, I just wanted to give you guys a little context of how we this came together. Uh, we worked together in solutions for the last two months uh, to give you this draft. Um, the calendars are negotiated through solutions because it changes all of our contracts. So all the bargain units have to be involved in that process as well as obviously yourselves through your appoint through the the two board members and of course the district um, we met through task forces as well as the solutions teams for two months to give you this draft we took a lot of things in consideration um, one of course we were working in collaboration with our memberships and our leaderships who approved these this draft uh, but also we looked at attendance rates, both for students and for teachers, as we picked these dates, the, the three days, uh, with the consideration that if we don't have to use them, that we are kind of killing two, uh, two, a bird with two, uh, two birds with one stone, uh, by also taking in consideration the days that attendance is the, mo is the lowest uh, for employees. Um, we also, uh, looked at the months that did not have a break for employees in case uh, we were not to use them. Um, and then if we look at the trends of this new normal, uh, I, we believe that this would take care of in case we have to take a few days uh, due to smoke or the electricity piece that uh, Dr. Wald mentioned. Um, so uh, we would be, of course, would welcome any feedback, uh, but also with the idea that any changes have to go back to all the bargaining units, all of our leaderships. Um, and this was, of course, taken in consideration feedback from uh, the two board members also participating in, in solutions team, and of course, Mr. Duffy and his staff. So thank you so much. Thank you, um, Mr. Gonzalez. Do we have any other public comment? There is no other public comment. Thank you, uh, Mr. Walton. Um, board, let's have a discussion. Uh, we're going to begin with the order of uh, Trustee Lara, Trustee Cuevas, Trustee Panas, and Trustee Phillips. And let's uh, remember to try to keep ourselves to five minutes. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. All of you did a lot of work on this. And uh, you know, as a teacher of 38 years, your, your calendar, your school calendar really does, is, is really important for so many just to kind of direct your planning for for the year, for the units, for the quarters, et cetera. And, and the, I see this document now, I see how it is a, this uh, calendar is a work schedule. And it is so that our thousands of employees, so 55 sites can all be ready, can all be set up and prepared for when that child shows up. And so I, I just want to, you know, it's not a frivolous document that people, oh, well, let's change this or that. It is, takes a lot of work coordinating. And um, I just think it, it was done very thoughtfully. And I, you know, I commend everybody who supported this. And I'm, you know, total in improvement. Yeah, approve it. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Trustee Lara. Madam President, I don't have any comments at this time. Thank you, Trustee Cuevas. Uh, Trustee Banas? Um, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Duffy and our solutions team for working on this. Um, I'm really glad to see we're doing this because I think it reflects uh, a new reality in California. I just have a couple questions. Um, was there any student or parent uh, involvement in, in picking the dates? Just informally, uh, we didn't do a formal outreach to parents to get their input. We spoke okay. to people here and there when we could, but not a formal process. And I was listening to Mr. Gonzalez and some of the really interesting concerns he brought up. Was there any conversation at all about like, about like trying to put the last two together or anything, or was it just, just I, maybe parents or maybe would like that, or was it just too hard to find a time when two days could be up against each other, particularly at the end of the year. Yeah, I think a little bit of both. Okay, thank you. Those are, those are all my comments. Thank you, Trustee Panas. Trustee Phillips? Well, I, I wanna thank our staff. Uh, and when I say 
did at home also talking about uh, for work uh, something that I've advocated for for over a year um, and I want to acknowledge uh, Ken Whittemore because this conversation really started to um, this conversation started to um, and he was it was uh, was happening so I I just have one question for clarifying and um, hit on it, but what is the average time off or the average number of days off that we've had each year? And I'm asking that just because I want to make sure that three days is sufficient enough to build in. So, Matt, you want to answer? Yeah, I don't, it's one, Mr. Phillips, just FYI, it's a little bit difficult to hear you, um, but I, you got oh. your question as um, how many days, and I don't have that in front of me. It's one, it's one to two for the last two years, the year so that we have, had, we had the fall of 18, the fall of 19, um, I think we didn't have fall of seven there were fires in the fall of 17 but i don't believe we closed we did close in the fall of 18 and the fall of 19. uh if somebody on my staff has those they they can share them but i believe it was one to two each of the those last two years yeah and i think we had one additional day at Pinole valley high school this year because of the electrical right that that took us over that's why when we looked at it we felt that three would be sufficient to start, we didn't want to put five and extend the whole school year by a week. That was one of the big discussion solutions had. Um, since one to two had been the average, we felt three was a good starting point. We would then go through the halfway through the year, see how it goes as we address the next three year contract calendars as well. And I do want to add just to that point, you know, we could have a situation where PG&E shuts off power at in a certain location so it's not the whole district shutting down you know it may be a school or two or three as we're such a big place um, that it, it may not end up with all 55 schools are closed all 55 schools go back on this extra day um, it could be a school by school thing um, just as a reminder thank you superintendent Thank you, Josie Phillips. Um, thank you, uh, Superintendent Duffy. Thank you uh, to all the staff and everybody who worked on creating this. I don't have any uh, further comments at this time. Thank you, board members. Great, thank you. We'll bring it back next board meeting for action. Could I say something on it real quick? Oh, yes, right. Student Trustee uh, Sumala, uh, Vasquez Sumala. And if Student Trustee Redell is with us right now too, um, if you would like to comment after Student Trustee Vasquez Sumala, please do so. Thank you. I was going to say, I think this is something, I like this. Um, I'm from Iowa, and we used to have snow days, like you said. So I know I know this, and I think it's important that we keep in mind that um, that change is going to happen um, with change that we can't control. There are changes that we need to do that we can control, and I think this is a good change. Um, global warming and that kind of climate change is going to happen, and I think in the future, this is something that they'll need to like look at again. So I think it is important that we do stuff like this um, because, yeah, like I said, it's, the world is changing. And so we need to keep up with it and there are changes that need to be had. So this is one of them, I think. So I really support it. Thank you so much, Student Trustee Vasquez Humala. Student Trustee Waddell. I don't think we can hear you, Student Trustee Rydell. I see that you're here and it shows as if your mic is on, but we can't hear you. Okay, Student Trustee Rydell, we'll come back to you um, soon after uh, Ms. Logan um, may have sent out an email already. So if you can check it, that would be great to see if we can get you connected on here with your mic and we, so we can hear your comments. Thank you so much. Um, 
So board, that leads us to our last discussion item, which is E2 updates, updates on the school operations during the COVID-19 closure. Great, well, that's coming up. Um, I'm gonna you know, let board know we're gonna do this um, in a similar fashion as we did last time. Um, if there's any comments just about kind of format or process, you can share them with me at the end or feel free to email them uh, to me. We just wanna continue to make sure we're giving the board and the community um, some update. I know Joanna Pace asked earlier how many people are on the meeting. My screen shows 70. Um, Ms. Sorry yep. to interrupt. Um, I wanted to ask you if you can please uh, have these updates, the presentations, like the last one that was presented at the board meeting and this one uh, posted. On the Friday before? Well, no, just posted along with the meeting information because when I'm on the, on the meeting and the agenda page, it's, there's nothing posted along with this. And I think it would be very important to, to have it posted on there too, because there's just the summary with the sure. four points. Yeah. And I think we need to have that updated so people can have access to this as well. Great, we'll post Thank it. You. Thank you. Um, we'll post it. Uh, so we can go to the next slide. Um, got my pictures, our photos over the um, slides. So um again thank you board and community for all the patience and flexibility as we um move into you know what's becoming a new normal for us with the closures um so we're gonna launch a phase two distance learning plan which we'll talk about a little bit later um next week when we come back from vacation and that's to provide a lot more consistency for all students in our district. Um, and we believe we've got a pretty good plan for that uh, to give students what they need and families what they need, um, knowing that everybody is navigating this circumstance very, very delicately. Um, we did formally, of course, announce school closures for the rest of the year. Um, so we will not be coming back into our school buildings uh, this year. And that has a lot of implications, which we'll talk about in this presentation as well. Um, and, you know, we did open school last Friday um, as a way to let students um, get any last technology needs. Um, they, they could uh, just for a few hours last Friday. And I want to thank the principals, especially, who've done an incredible job being there for our students, getting buildings open, helping get Chromebooks out, and then all of the other staff who've been supporting. Uh, before we go into the distance learning, I wanted to share that I had a chance um, last week to do a phone call with a number of our students, especially high school, well, only high school and specifically seniors. Um, and just hearing about their experience is very, very powerful and what they're all going through, um, especially the seniors and their um, feelings about graduation and promotion and credits and all of these things and, and friends and not seeing friends and not seeing friends again. Um, and so I, I want us to be really, really mindful of just the emotional toll on a lot of our students, especially students who've been together for four years, eight years, 10 years. Um, so before jumping in, I just wanted to turn it over to Dawit for a minute and just ask if you could just share a little bit about your experience um, being out of school and how you're doing or out of the school building, um, how you're doing with it all. Um, and just, you know, maybe giving some of the folks who are listening a little bit of insight into the, the student experience. And then we'll go right into um, the big areas of distance learning, food and care uh, from our team. You might still be on mute.
Oops, sorry, that's my bad. Um, so I was gonna say thank you, but so first of all, I'm not a senior, so I'm not I'm not in the same boat as where like they can't see their friends and stuff. Um, I'm I am sad because now I don't think I'll be able to see a lot of my senior friends. Um, so that'll be tough. I think overall though, um, I feel like I'm doing pretty well. Um, I think in some ways this is a a good chance for uh for my family. It stayed frozen. Am I the only one who can't hear or can everybody else hear? No, I can't hear. Sports that we don't really get to see each other. Um, can you guys hear me still? Yes. Okay. Um, that this has given us kind of a chance to really um, sit down for the first time in a while. Um, I think for me personally, a hard part with all of this is, yeah, definitely not being able to see other people. But one really big problem is my family. Um, a lot of my family right now is sick, and we've had some people die in the family. And that's a really hard thing right now. Um, and so I really I, I feel for the people right now who have um, family, who have, uh, who have conditions, who are sick, um, who have people who are dying. Because a lot of places, they can have up to like max of like 10 people or so at the funerals. So you can't really show your, um, you can't really like hug your family and your friends and really get that love that you would, something like that. Um, so I'm, I'm feeling for those people. Uh, I'm also, I'm, I'm a little bit worried. It cut off again. We lost you again. None of them have jobs. So I'm a little bit worried about that, and I think it's it's hard for me. Um, and it's, it's just a hard time. So I think, yeah, so personally, I'm doing pretty well. Um, I think, but I think I have it pretty good. I have it pretty well. Um, my family's pretty well off, so I, I'm really fortunate. But I really feel for the people who really don't have very much. And um, I think another problem is a lot of people are really lonely right now. Um, and uh, they don't really have the right connections, um, especially right now since it's spring break. So um the teachers aren't there can't hear you it cut off again we lost and, but like a bunch of our friends um got together a bunch of our students we all got together and we just kind of just we talked um talked through all of this and had some fun so i think that's been fun and uh but i'm it's i don't think everybody has that support like i do so i think some people are struggling with kind of this loneliness that comes yeah. with being stuck in your house well thank but, you yeah. thanks for sharing really appreciate it of course um, you know because we are here for for you guys at the end of the day so just kind of knowing you. What you're, what's happening with you is key uh let's go back to our presentation we'll talk a little bit more about what we're planning for distance learning um, what we're planning for um, food, care, et cetera. So I'll let um, Dr. Guerrero jump into the next uh, couple of slides on distance learning with uh, Tracy Logan as well. Hi, good evening all. Um, that was a perfect segue by your student trustee, thank you so much for being able to share that with us. Uh, uh, also, especially the personal information that you shared because that is very relevant as to what um, our, our students and our community are dealing with and also our staff. Um, I have an active link there uh, that will lead you to the distance learning planning guidance. Um, and that is just the big, picture uh, of which part it, uh, is the expectations that you uh, saw last time as far as the estimate amount of time that students would spend in face-to-face, um, -face, uh, quote unquote, uh, type of instruction. Um, the plan itself uh, outlines the different phases that um, have uh, taken place and have been part of us in phase one, uh, being able to have um, planning around what phase two would uh, entail, a lot of collaboration 
uh, has taken um, place. As we move forward, um, everything that we set on doing is very much anchored on the four core principles and of course our theory of action. We want to be able to personalize as much as possible, taking into consideration what our, um, uh, what our student trustee uh, said that everybody's going through different things. So how can we be able to um, plan lessons and deliver lessons in such a way that is personalized to the needs of the students. Um, right on par with that is what type of learning can happen outside of face-to-face -face interaction with teachers. You know, are we talking about uh, projects that are assigned, videos that are uploaded, and this really an opportune time for teachers to really innovate and think outside the box to be able to reach students. As we uh, also focus on um, mastery versus focusing on grades. You know, we had a group of folks uh, be able to come together and really acknowledge just the different um, times that we're dealing with and that um, your uh, typical A, B, C, D, F uh, grades are not appropriate at this time, but rather are more of uh, in the fashion of a past, no past. Uh, and again, focus on mastery, right? So what does a student have to do to demonstrate that they know this concept? And so we're moving beyond our typical one through 20 uh, questions, uh, read this and answer questions, is how can we better assess the mastery that students have on different concepts? And of course, being able to um, um, keep uh, a focus on deeper learning, uh, what can we do to get students to think um, uh, on their own and be able to problem solve and really move away from rote type of practices or busy work? So uh, decisions such as um, uh, being able to have either um, packets or digital devices in the lower grades, right? Kind of take us as in an example with that. You know, so one way is to be able to have uh, universal packets for all, but is that aligned to us being able to personalize the learning for students? So uh, as we come up with different decisions and problem solve, I wanted to be able to get you in, in, in you know, into the also uh, being able to look at, uh, at the four elements that we focus on. And this same four elements were also uh, on the uh, teacher expectations document that we shared last time. And it's also the anchoring piece that we have in our distance learning planning guidance. Uh, and of course, the underlying concept is that we're all in this together. Being able to have collaboration and problem solving. Right now, we have multiple task forces going on that are analyzing um, grading. So for instance, what does pass, no pass mean regarding grading? and uh, what are we expecting teachers to do? What are we expecting parents and, um, and students to do uh, in this regard? Uh, what about graduation? Uh, what are we talking about assessments? And of course, uh, for English learners, uh, what does language acquisition, how does it fare with this long distance, distance learning type of learning? Uh, other issues such as uh, issues that are timely at this particular time of the year, transfers, enrollment, etc. So a lot of unanswered questions, but also a lot of problem solving and thinking outside the box that doing these things are not necessarily the way that we've always done them, but we have uh, folks that are working on this. So it's not necessarily something that I decided or cabinet decided, but are people coming together to be able to outline this thinking outside the, the outside the box, uh, formulating a plan and be able to decide on a timeline and best way to be able to communicate this plan. And of course, when I talk about collaboration, I'm talking about UTR, um, WCCAA, uh, different um, departments that are working together. And we also have a standing meeting with our parents that are giving us input into the different documents and different things that they uh, as parents want to be able to hear. As Mr. Duffy also mentioned, he's met with some students to be able to get uh, their take on different things that are going on. And students are also going to be part of task forces that we're building, uh, especially as it pertains to the class of 2020 and just being able to um, 
ease their anxiety uh, because this is certainly not the way they wanted their uh, high school career and of course our senior year to be able to end. And of course, this also takes us to, you know, how do we balance high expectations and accountability? You know, we, we want our students to learn, we want teachers to be teaching and engaged every single day. Uh, but how do we balance that with flexibility, with empathy and with grace, knowing as our, uh, our student trustee mentioned earlier, uh, people are dying, uh, people are getting sick. Uh, we're asking parents to jump into a role that they didn't have any training for and be able to do it and do it well. Um, be able to get all this uh, learning devices, which entails a different type of learning to our students. So how do we balance that? Because the message that we want to communicate is certainly not one of we don't expect highly from our kids and from our staff but rather we understand the different situations that they're going through and are able to empathize, show some grace as we work on this together. Uh, so Tracy, if you can go on to the next slide, please. Uh, so how is, uh, is the uh, technical aspect, what does that look like as far as distance uh, learning is concerned? So we do have content delivery platforms. In this case, we have either Google Classroom or Seesaw, and this is where teachers are able, um, um, able to uh, post their lessons and where students are able to upload any type of um, uh, assessment or learning that they do. We also have productivity tools that allow the um, content um, platforms to be able to function well and for students to be able to engage. So we have Google Suite, in which it involves the uh, doc slice in the calendar. We also have uh, Google Meet and also Zoom. And of course, um, as you heard earlier and as we experienced earlier, uh, there's some navigating to do uh, around the legal and, and the privacy issues with the web. Um, video conferencing. And at this time, um, Tracy's going to jump in and explain a little bit about that. And then we'll go on just uh, briefly being able to mention just the content and the online mechanisms that we have as part of our hub. Tracy. Thanks, Gracie. So I did want to speak specifically to our video conferencing tools. As Dr. Guerrero mentioned, we do support currently two tools, Google Meet and Zoom. Um, as a result of that, we are doing training with teachers to be sure that teachers understand how to use these two different tools and when to use the different tools. Um, and of course, we're navigating the legal and privacy issues. You've all undoubtedly seen in the news, there's been a lot about Zoom, um, Zoom bombing, um, questions and concerns around privacy, around security. I want to assure the board and the public that we take this very, very seriously and continue to read up, investigate, uh, shore up our configurations um, in both platforms on a daily basis. At this time, we believe that a uh, student trustee spoke about loneliness and the importance of connection. And at this time, we believe that both of these tools, Google Meet and Zoom, allow teachers to connect with students in a way that's very important at this time of isolation. It allows teachers to look students in their eyes, for students to see each other, um, to deliver information and instruction um, directly to students and to be there as a support in a way that posted not real time um, tools do not allow for. So um, we are continuing to navigate the legal and the privacy. I will say that both Google Meet and Zoom thus far have done an incredible job to step up um, and shore up privacy and security. And at the end of the day, um, a tool is a tool and uh, while we will do everything that we can to shore up the technical side of things, this is also where digital citizenship really plays a, a key role. Um, teachers are able to use a waiting room feature in Zoom that allows students um, to wait um, until they're brought into the space to, to control it more and make sure that it's safe. Um, Zoom has also enacted a password, so it requires a student to have a password in order to enter. A teacher can also lock the Zoom 
um, once students have arrived so that no one else can enter. So there are settings in place that a teacher can enact. There are configurations that we push at the admin level for security purposes. And then on top of that, there's the discussion and importance of what does it look like to be um, respectful and caring um, while online and what do we do when that doesn't happen just in the same way that um, we would do that when um, a student is in the a physical world. So I'll leave it at that for now, but please know um, that this will be an ongoing conversation because it's incredibly important. We do want our students and our teachers to be able to connect and we want them to be safe. Thank you, Ms. Logan. And um, uh, a way that uh, the students are able to connect and be able to navigate this digital learning while also being able to practice different skills they have gained is through the different apps that we have on our Clever um, in which we do have um, um, apps available in different programs that they can be able to log in um, being able to just go to a single page and they're able to have this accessible to them. So that's our online learning application hub. As far as the content, uh, we do have the board approved instructional materials that you guys have seen. Uh, so we have brought those up to the board for uh, approval. And of course, uh, it is very important to us that as we bring those, we always focus on whether they do have online student components and assessment. And um, those uh, are the ones that are also highlighted uh, specifically during this distance learning uh, phase because we also rely on that uh, for us to be able to deliver instruction and also for students to be able to demonstrate that they're able to um, master certain standards. Uh, we have been uh, uh, building the uh, resources that we have uh, posted um, by content area, and all these are uh, free uh, supplemental digital programs, which also include uh, adapted assessment tools. Uh, I do want to be able to say that um, um, we want to be able to support all the different uh, type of programs that um, we have engaged our teachers in being able to uh, embed into their Google Classroom and lesson delivery. And so for that, um, um, we are uh, very cognizant and very, uh, very specific about the ones that we do include just so that we don't have to uh, put teachers through additional training, perhaps something that just became available free uh, for now because of the digital learning space, but being very cognizant that uh, if it's a new application that we have to train teachers on, then uh, that would take some time away from what um, we want um, teachers to be able to spend with their students. And if, Ms. Logan, if you can click really quick on the e-learning resources by content area so that um, our uh, public can be able to see just what we have built on our website. Uh, that's available as far as the content areas are concerned. And also we do have as a reminder, the um, um, training that's available on how to use the different tools. Uh, for some it's a reminder, for others it's a way to be able to really um, get, get some knowledge about what's in our page and what's available to be able to support teachers as much as possible as they, uh, as they plan their digital learning. Uh, in our um, website, we do have it divided by three areas, an area for parents, an area for students, an area for teachers. And this uh, is available for uh, teachers and also for, for students so they can be able to practice through Clever, which is the platform that I explained earlier. And uh, now us being able to look at our accessibility and connectivity, uh, Ms. Logan is going to go into, into details as to where we are with that. Thank Great. you. Thank you. So um, as Dr. Guerrero mentioned, um, access is key uh, to distance learning. And we know that our students are in different places. Um, and so in terms of Chromebooks, at this point, we have over 23,000 Chromebooks in the hands of our students, including many of our kindergarten and first grade students. So I want to 
take a moment to really thank all of the folks that have been participating in making this happen. Major shout out and thank you to our principals, to our site clerical staff, to our assistant principals and vice principals, and to all of the folks who have been contacting families, preparing devices, um, and really gotten as many devices as possible out into the hands of our children. I know that just last week alone, some 1,500 devices went from our schools into the homes of families. And we're still not done. So um, I said last week that we would be working on final numbers in terms of who has what and what the remaining need is. And we're still shoring up those numbers. Many of our principals are on, it's spring break, are on vacation, um, rightfully, needfully this week. Um, and so as soon as everyone is back, that will be a key focus. Uh, where is, is the remaining need? and then focusing on the parent training piece. So it's fantastic that we were able to get many of our Chromebooks into the hands of our young learners, and we also wanna make sure that we can provide the information, training, and support to families so that those Chromebooks can really be maximized in the hands of their learners at home. So in addition to devices, there is, of course, internet connectivity. Um, I spoke last week about the hotspots that we have already delivered. We have at this point about 600 students on the wait list and our focus right now is calling wait list families to support them to get connected. So there are a number of free opportunities, Comcast Internet Essentials, AT&T, Xfinity, etc. And our school community outreach workers and our site clerical folks are working this week, many thanks to them, to call families, make sure families know what options are available to them and support them to get connected. So we believe that this is the first step to really confirm that people know what options are available, help them get connected, and then we will use a multi-prong approach. So absolutely maximize the free available that's out there in addition uh, order additional hotspots, partner with Comcast Internet Essentials to extend the two months of free to six months of free internet access. So it's something that families don't have to worry about. They just know that they have that access over the course of the next six months. Um, and then advocacy at the state level. I do want to highlight uh, the fact that we are not alone um, in our digital access concerns and at the same time we want to do everything possible to get our students connected um, it is a, an an absolute issue of um, civil rights um, and so we are taking this multi-prong approach to ensure that our families can get connected and in the meantime as dr guerrero, guerrero said operating with flexibility no student will be penalized for lack of access. Um, we are working as a community to support students where they are with the access that they have. Um, and first and foremost is their social, emotional, and mental health and well-being. Yes, yeah, so tonight the report on foods. Um, the update is we've served over 93,000 meals last week. That number continues to increase as we're ser serving over a total of 17 sites, nine of our schools and eight of the community locations. But this week we're moving to, to serving suppers as well. So those numbers will increase even more as the need for food and the amount of distribution goes out. So again, you wanna to continue to thank First Student and our community volunteers who've been the backbone of our delivery and our food distribution at the locations. This week, looking at the numbers for the sites for volunteers, we actually have filled most all, all positions for that. While we appreciate the help of, of our community and the volunteers, we really need to continue to work with our union to get our employees back to work. So we continue to support the functions within the central kitchen and the distribution site to make sure we have continuity of service. Uh, we continue to maintain the infection control practices, which uh, our social distancing and protective equipment for our employees, as well as cleaning and sanitized work locations. Our custodial staff has returned to work this week at the nine locations where we're serving uh, at the food distribution sites to help with the cleaning of the restrooms, um, backup support for our groups that are out there on the front lines. So that's my report this evening. Thank you, uh, staff. Uh, thank you, Mr. Duffy, for the update. Um, 
Do we have any public comment? Oh, there's just two more slides. Sorry. Um, really you. quickly um, on the care. So in terms of creating some spaces for child care, um, Contra Costa County and the County Board of Ed is taking the lead on this. So we're not charged right now with needing to create our own space. They're trying to do this as a coordinated countywide effort with different locations across the county. Um, and so they're looking at some spots in West County, uh, potentially a preschool to start at. So um, we're just gonna continue to work with them and take their lead on it. Um, and then as I mentioned last time, we're continuing to reach out through our own special ed providers, our own mental health providers, reaching out to kids who have been on our caseloads to check in with them and see how they're doing. And in terms of communications, um, the past three weeks, the district has put out a communication every night to keep our families updated um, in terms of the latest news about the school closures and the crisis we're undergoing. We're going to transition to more school-centered communications over the next uh, couple of weeks so that uh, it's more uh, towards a normalcy, uh, more principal and school-based communication. Um, we will continue our social media outreach for resources, both district and community-based. And uh, we are expanding our internal communications capacity and it's our goal to return to storytelling and positive news so that uh, we're telling uh, stories about the positive things that are still happening in our district. Um, so that's the communications update. All right, good evening. So I'm uh, updating on staff and work. So we're continuing to work with the unions on define, defining the essential work. Uh, this has changed a bit with the change deadlines. But we're still, the overarching theme is to keep them at home as much as possible. But when the work does need to come, when the workers do need to come and be physically present, we are making sure, as Mr. Freeze mentioned, the safety procedures, the cleaning, and masks. Um, HR has updated the webpage to provide detailed information on the emergency paid leaves under the Federal Act. And we emailed a very detailed letter to our employees on Friday outlining 11 different areas and topics. So we're encouraging them to sign up for direct deposit. It, for those that used to get their checks on site, we're uh, encouraging them to make sure that they're checking their emails and providing a way for them to get their passwords if they have not checked in for, the, for a while. We're making sure they know that this information can be found on our webpage. And we're putting a lot of forms online, like our time cards, and um, retirement enrollments and things like that. So we're trying to make it as easy as possible. Thank you. So Ms. Hernandez Jarvis, we do have two uh, uh, public comment comments. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Williams, if you still would like to comment, please raise your hand. Ms. Goldie Williams. There we go. Uh, Goldie Williams, uh, unmute yourself and you can speak. Good evening, everyone. Um, I wrote my question out really carefully and really detailed. And I just like to say that um, with that past presentation, the majority of what I wanted to know was answered. Um, I just want to say great job. 23,000 um, devices getting out there. That is phenomenal. Um, but I'm still gonna read what I wanted to say. Um, good evening, everyone. In this very trying time, I hope you're all taking care of yourselves, your families, and your personal community. As we all face our new normals, my prayers are with us all. Um, my questions were surrounding the last quarter of school and you answered some of what I wanted to know about, which was access. And my concern is for the students that don't have access. And I love that you said they won't be penalized. Um, the other portion that I wanted to know about is our teachers. Um, what kind of support are we giving to them? Um, and when I'm speaking, I'm, um, I'm speaking of um, um, the support for both our students and teachers, but for their mental health, for their support, and for our teachers, what, I, I wanna know what we're doing, not 
so there's three categories in my head. There's our teachers in general. What, what support are we giving them? The second piece is what support are we specifically giving to them and our students for their mental health support? And then thirdly, what about our teachers that um, are taking care of little ones at home or adult dependent um, family members and at the same time having the expectation to be able to teach class? Um, I, uh, and also, actually, I'm just checking my notes. Also, um, I know you said that students won't be penalized, but they're going to be penalized if they don't have the computer, the Chromebook, um, and they end up falling further behind. So of the 600 on the list right now, I also want to know how many are African American. Um, but what I want to know, so inclusive of that, and let me try to summarize what I'm asking. What I want to know is, for this last quarter, what I heard, and I'm going to put it in my words, so I'm paraphrasing, um, there's a, a higher expectation for students to participate and to submit work for the last quarter. So my question is specifically, and I love the words we're using, what are we doing thinking outside the box and thinking with empathy so that one, addressing our students falling further behind, but specifically to the student say that doesn't have a hot spot to, right now. The 13th is on Monday. Um, who knows when they're going to get a hot spot? And who knows the ones that, um, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm being text about my, what I'm saying. Um, but I understand that the Chromebooks are out there, but my real concern is the access. And when we say we're, they're not going to be penalized, what I want to know is what does that mean? In other words, let's just take the example of one student that doesn't have access Please conclude uh, your remarks. Okay. If there's a student that doesn't have access to a hotspot and they don't have it by the 13th, that last quarter, how are they going to be marked? And what is our real empathetic expectation for all these students? Thank and you for your comment. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Demetrio Gonzalez. Demet Mr. Gonzalez, if you will um, unmute yourself and you have three minutes. Thank you. Good evening, board and community again. Demetria Gonzalez, president of UTR. Um, I just wanted to start by thanking all the parents um, and students out there, and of course, our teachers. I know that this is a very difficult time, and, and like Dr. Guerrero mentioned, and our last speaker mentioned, uh, we have to continue to lead with empathy um, and patience and support of every human being in our district. Um, I just want to remind the board that this is a fluid document, right? This will constantly change um, because we are getting new information on a weekly basis, right? And uh, we have to get input from our employees, our families, and our students on whether this is working or not. Now, this plan is starting next week, right? So far, the teaching has been occurring, um, has been practically volunteered, right? Without the expectation of teaching as educators were trying to get their, their homes together, um, so, so it was kind of exciting to see some of the survey results that we just got. Uh, we sent out a survey last Friday, uh, over 600 mem members have responded, um, and 81% of them said they've already been in daily com communication with families and students, even without being mandated to having to do it on a daily, daily basis. And I think that just speaks about the commitment our educators have to teaching our kids. Um, they also listed that they are working anywhere between three to 12 hours on a daily basis, trying to learn and trying to provide whatever they can to students in this new digital, digital world. And lastly, one piece of information that was very critical to me was that 60% of them reported they're taking care of their own kids at home. And that's why we have to continue to lead with, with patience and fluidity because we cannot dictate specifically when a teacher can log in because they're having to take care of their kids at home. We have a lot of teachers who are also single parents. We got to take that in consideration as we make any decision and every decision in this plan. Uh, we also have taken consideration many teachers reported their students are having to work during the day because their parents have been laid off, are now unemployed. Um, so many are having to babysit or take care of their their siblings um, uh, during the day. So they're not able to access the digital learning as they might have been able to do it before. Um, and then lastly, I just wanna thank our tech team and our tech teacher leaders because 
um, all of this week, even during break, they still provided PD. Last week, hundreds of teachers logged in to, to do professional development. I was able to be in two of them where there were over 100 people logged in trying to learn this new systems um, and refresh uh, what they already knew, but they now have to do. So, so I just wanna end by thanking them, thanking you and thanking our staff because it has been a big learning curve for all of us uh, and we'll continue to learn uh, and change as we might have to. Thank you. That concludes public comment on this item. Thank you, Mr. Walton, and thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Gonzalez, for your comments. Um, board, uh, let's have a discussion. And again, let's follow the same order that we had before with Trustee Lada, Trustee Cuevas, Trustee Panas, and Trustee Phillips. Thank you. Yes, thank you, um, Trustee Hernandez Chavez. And um, thank you to everybody who's doing so much out there to um, educate our kids, feed them, and and reach out to them it, this is just a, an amazing thing to see uh, how much dedication there is and uh, i do have to say i constantly worry about uh, that they're protected when they're out there that they are doing all those practices and and um you know those that's really important it's very very important that they model that also for everybody else I'm concerned about the equity issues, making sure that everybody uh, that we're reaching out and making sure everybody has those access as we as much as we can. Uh, we know about the, how uh, sometimes equity is such a, a challenge, so um, we have to keep that in mind. And I know there's been a lot of communication from staff, and that. That's very important because it, it serves to kind of, um, you know, calm your nerves when you get these communications about, oh, this is what they're doing. This is how they're moving. And, and you see that um, you haven't been just abandoned, but there's a lot of people working behind the scenes here. So I have to um, echo the concerns about social, emotional, mental health support, not just for students, but also for teachers. I echo that as well. And um, one of the things I would like to see is that keep us as a board updated on the, the whole technology um, status, uh, how we're doing in that. I understand there used to be a, a tech committee, I think. And so for now and in the future, we're gonna need to know more about that and maybe give more input and, and have more discussion about that. So I'm hoping we can get more information on those things, but um, thank you. And I really do need a copy of that uh, slide uh, presentation. It, uh, it's really very good. And I'm hoping you'll post it uh, as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Trustee Lara. Trustee Panas. Thank you. Uh President Hernandez Jarvis. So <clears throat> I'd also like to thank Mr. Duffy and the staff for all the communications that have gone out. I've had a lot of people say that they're happy to see what's going out. Um, Mr. Duffy, I'd like to thank you for bringing up the emotional toll of your comments on our students. And I'd like to thank uh, Trustee Vasquez Zamala for, for sharing his thoughts on what's been going on here. I want to talk about the Chromebooks and the hotspots a little bit more. Um, so Ms. Logan, I think you said that we have about, we're about 600 hotspots short as far as we know. Does that mean we're 600 Chromebooks short as well or is there are different numbers in play there? There are different numbers. So the Chromebooks, I don't have a hard number on yet. That's okay. the data that I'm gathering from principals, but they're not all here this week. So I'll have firmer numbers next week on the Chromebooks. The hotspots, the 600, is a self-reported number that we are aware of right now. Um, and I anticipate the number is actually higher than that. And I think we won't find that out until next week. Um, Trustee Lara mentioned the, you know, the equity of access issue. And I, I think that quite frankly, not until we actually kick off our distance learning on Monday, will 
more students come forward and say, I don't have home access. So it's something that we're going to continue to update you on and continue to work towards in terms of a multi prong approach. I did mention that the 600 that are on the wait list, that those are the folks that community workers and clerical are calling this week because many folks on that list are able and may not know that they're able to connect to existing free offers, Comcast, AT&T, et cetera. So we really wanna do that outreach work first and make sure that families know what options they have available to them. If none of those options pan out, then um, hotspots is the solution that we're looking at. Okay, and does, does Comcast, for example, require a cable installation or something if they don't have that? Or is that- Comcast, Comcast yes, Comcast does. They've waived all of their other requirements. So no longer do they require uh, a family to have clean debt. So they've waived the debt um, requirement. They also do not require that families provide proof of free and reduced lunch. All a family has to do is state the school that they go to. Um, the only other requirement is that it's for new customers only. So families that have been a customer over the last 90 days are not considered new. So again, that's where we would look to a hotspot as that solution. Okay, and does the money that we that the Ed Fund is gathering, do you think that's gonna cover this? Or are we gonna have to look at finding additional money to cover the Chromebooks and the hotspots? So, uh, Mr. Duffy, if you want to weigh in on the Ed Fund dollars. Sure. Um, you know, Trustee Panis, we don't know the answer to that exactly. Um, we're also anticipating we may not get a lot of um, Chromebooks back from our seniors, you know, if we can't get to them. So there's some things we can't fully answer. Um, so we're going to continue to aggressively raise money as if we don't have enough. We're going to assume we don't have enough um, and really try to use the Ed Fund dollars to support students and use the reimbursement dollars we're getting from the state to support our employees. Okay. And, and this is Dr. Wold. Um, we are getting, we did get some SB 117 monies that would allow us to purchase these extra devices. There. So again, as, as Mr. Duffy said, we will supply the first device. I think we should utilize our benefactors to support things that we wouldn't normally be supplying for our students. And so that's what we're trying to do budgetarily, using the okay. one-time monies that are coming from the state and federal government. Okay. I, I'm just asking, like, you know, once we figure out what that number is, I'm hoping that we can move as quickly as possible to get that stuff out to our families who don't have access right now. I had a couple of questions about our, um, the meals we're serving. Oh, we said last week we served 9,300 meals. Is that like um, half that's breakfast and half that's lunch or is that, that must be right? Or? Yes, yeah, it says split between breakfast and lunch. Okay. Um, and 93,000. Right, I know, that's a lot. It's incredible. Yeah, it's almost, you know, it's close to, to 20,000 a day. So, and that's, so like 10,000 individuals. So that, that's great. Are we planning to have more sites or is this our list of sites right now, the nine schools and the eight faith-based organizations or? So, at, this point, at this point, the nine sites are all food service can handle right now. Okay, okay. But I understand, and Lewis can correct me if I'm wrong, that our community-based sites have asked for more, so they believe they're able to um, get out more. Um, so we've been delivering more to them. And today also I had a conversation with the county um, about a one of the largest food banks that's looking for a big parking lot to set up shop. And so we'll be working with them also. Um, over the next week to find a location that fits um, for our community and for them. So I know that the food, uh, the food bank uh, has been typically delivers to a lot of our schools. Is that the same thing or is that something different, Mr. Duffy? No, this is an organization, I think it's called White Pony. Oh yes, okay, great. So um, that's who they're looking for a big spot that they can kind of hunker down in and we okay. can support them. Um, and is, 
is the food bank still able, able to deliver to some of our, our sites? Or they, do you know if they're not doing that at this point? I don't have an update on that. I know we, I, overall, I don't, we don't have like personal delivery going on. Um, so I don't think we've made any progress on that since last week. However, um, one thing I neglected to mention is one part of the Ed Fund fundraising, one key part of their strategy, which both um, President Hernandez Jarvis and Mr. Phillips spoke to um, last week was direct service and direct funding to families. So that is a part of their strategy and a piece of uh, their fundraising. Um, and that they're still trying to figure out what that looks like, if it is going to be grocery cards or grocery bags, but um, they will be working on, you know, direct support to high needs families. Um, and as that gets fleshed out, I'll give you more details on it. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering what we're thinking about our summer months and are we putting together a task force that includes community partners, and local experts on summer learning as well Trustee as- Trustee Panas, it seems that you're cutting off. Let me try. I'm wondering uh, about, is this any better? I can hear you. Okay. Um, I'm wondering what we're thinking about summer learning and are we putting together a task force that includes community partners and local experts on summer learning uh, as well as staff to make recommendations to the board? Yes. So, I mean, if, if, uh, uh, if I can add just uh, some of the work that's happening uh, as far as our task force that's really looking into what would have been our summer school. And um, if Mr. Duffy uh, wants to add something to that, um, of course, he can be able to kind of paint the bigger picture. Um, so uh, we had anticipated to be able to offer credit recovery for high school students uh, uh, over the summer. Well, uh, that uh, mostly entailed a hybrid of courses um, that would involve digital learning and face-to-face. -face. So here we have the uh, opportunity, um, not knowing that we would have it uh, at this particular time to do digital learning. So we are looking at uh, kids who would have had to come to summer school to be able to recover some credits and be able to do it now. As far as the learning uh, goes that usually happens over the summer and perhaps any types of programs that would have uh, prevented any summer slide to kind of kick in, uh, that is another thing that we're thinking outside the box, knowing that it's a high possibility that we may not be able to get into our buildings um, as well over the summer. So how would that look like, right? So it would involve uh, some type of digital aspect. And I do have a task force that has um, folks at the um, high school level and the middle school level uh, coming together along with students and some parents as to be able to come up with a plan on how we can embed and incorporate all the elements that we have in play right now is uh, as part of distance learning and how that can continue on through the months of June and July as well. So definitely uh, anticipating uh, some work to happen around that uh, aspect and of course taking advantage of, them, of, uh, of those months as well. Okay, thank you for those comments. And I'm just hoping that we can include some of our local community groups and we've got some real experts on summer learning who live in West County. So I think we'd be well off to incorporate them as well. Absolutely. I, sorry, I just want to add one thing. I, I, I do want to help us manage expectations. I think the likelihood we have summer, like kids back in buildings in the summer is probably 50-50 at this point. And we're already seeing some of summer camps and summer programs starting to make official cancellations. Um, so we would love to get our students as much instruction as we possibly can. Um, we're going to have to continue to think about it online as well as in person because it just might not happen. Okay, um, I'm wondering what kind of resources from outside the district we're accessing to help us think deeply about our distance learning plans. Um, 
I can share a little, and I mean, we are part of a lot of different communities of practice. I know Dr. Guerrero meets with a whole set of chief academic officers across the region. Um, I'm connected with all of our county districts. Uh, I meet every week, now two weeks, with the four big urban districts, Oakland, San Francisco, us, and San Jose, talk about what we're doing. So there's been an unprecedented amount of sharing going on across, mm -hmm. really nationally, but across the Bay, um, everybody's sharing what they're doing, what they think's working. So we're not insular in any way. Great, thank you. Um, one last question here. I mean, now that the UCs and the CSUs have waived um, their requirement for letter grades for winter, or spring, winter, spring, and summer, along with suspension of ACT and SAT requirements. Are we ready to say that we're gonna do, or have we already said we're gonna be doing pass-fail grading or do we need to take some steps to actually make that come to fruition? Or are we not, not ready to take that step yet? Where do we stand on that? We're ready, uh, but we haven't made it official to our stakeholders yet. I mean, we're on vacation this week like Dr. Guerrero said, there's a number of task force and working groups, but we're ready to make that call and say we're going to a pass, no pass system. We think it's ultimate form of flexibility because it still gives kids grades. It still has some form of, I mean, gives kids credit, excuse me, has some form of expectation, um, but gives a lot of flexibility. So we're, we're ready to do it. Um, we just need to get our ducks in a row internally before we go out. And I'll see if Dr. Guerrero wants to add anything to that. So we uh, also hope to be able to answer uh, questions that come up with the past no, uh, no past situation. So the first thing that comes into mind is, okay, okay so what does meetings. a pass include or what does a no pass include? So okay. like Stephanie mentioned, I do have a group that's working on what type of grades are, are, uh, are going to be taken up. How about if a student doesn't complete or participate? So I have a group that's uh, made up of administrators, of teachers, of special education educators, of uh, um, ELD uh, educators, dual language uh, immersion educators uh, and some uh, community uh, folks to be able to weigh in, uh, uh, weigh in different things that uh, can go into play. So the, uh, whenever we do present it and communicate it to our stakeholders, we actually answer some of the questions that uh, may come with this uh, as opposed to just being able to mention that and just leaving it as is. So uh, we'll definitely be able to present um, a whole comprehensive package, if you would, after, uh, uh, after the folks who are doing this work is able to kind of uh, be able to define the different uh, intricacies uh, so that we can have as many, um, as few uh, rather unanswered questions. And we plan to be able to uh, bring that to the board on the next board meeting on April 22nd. I gave the task force a deadline of sending us, uh, of, of discussing something to me so that we can be able to discuss uh, with uh, Mr. Duffy on that Monday before the, uh, one state that we meet so that we can be able to bring together a plan for you guys. Thank you for okay, asking. Thank you. That's yes. all my questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Trustee Panis. Um, we've lost connection with uh, Trustee uh, Hernandez. Oh, yeah. Right. I'm working on it. She's oh. get her back okay. in as a panelist, uh, but oh. if you share while okay. we're getting that set up. That'd be great. Okay. Uh, were there any other board members who did not share yet? Madam Chair, if I could just make some quick comments. Um, first of all, thank you to all our staff and our teachers and our students and families and our community partners as a whole. Um, before I begin, I just want to extend my um, condolences to our student trustee Vasquez Sumala uh, 
as evidence of just how uh, each of our families, our communities are being affected, and not just locally, but across the nation and the world uh, with this pandemic. And so I'm very sorry to hear your family has been personally um, affected um, so tragically. You, have my, you and your family have my condolences. But I do want to say um, some of what I'm hearing, and these are all just suggestions, and I'm going to go as quickly as I can. They're not... Um, they're not, again, they're for you to take and do what you'd like and see if they're, they're, they're helpful in any way. The first issue is what I'm hearing across the state and locally in districts is that it, it really is our youngest learners that are suffering the most during this interrupted time of education. But we find that our older, older learners in high school are, have the capacity uh, to be more self-directed, uh, to sign in, to have minimally years of schooling already in place to help them access content, however we're delivering it. So I was just curious, a couple of things in terms of these gaps. One, are we, are we able to monitor the way other districts are monitoring, uh, how often our students are utilizing and checking in uh, online? Yes, we can do that. And a big okay. work next week as everybody gets back will be by the end of the week to really know who's logged in, who we haven't heard from, who's using their technology, how much, how often. Okay, so my next question then is, it'd be good for us to start putting in place how you're gonna uh, disaggregate that data by our, our grade levels to really see uh, who's accessing and who we have context with. I know that there's a whole set of students that I just wanna call the disappeared. We don't know, nobody's had contact with them, their families. We have many people, their families. There's lots of things that could be going on. And so um, I'm just wondering to what extent can we think about a buddy system that gets implemented between classrooms within school, uh, classrooms that existed before we went to non-physical classrooms to have folks just have somebody to check in with because I'm finding that, I'm hearing that teachers are trying to reach folks. Some of our community workers are trying to reach folks, but sometimes we just need as many people as possible doing the outreach and not having it just fall on one person because every family is dealing with different reasons as to why they're available and how they're uh, wanting to make themselves accessible as well to um, the, um, com the needs of the schools. The other thing was, have we thought about, there might be some things we can't ever overcome. We might not be able to ever overcome people getting real comfortable, kids, little kids, getting real comfortable with, with Chromebooks, with um, connectivity issues, even their parents. Have we thought about utilizing the time, the airspace that we have where we normally pay to broadcast our board meetings and provide content via that cable access that is essentially a uh, classroom via television in some ways, maybe some basic planned out instruction, especially for our earlier grades. They're just learning how to read, they're learning um, how to um, do the basics where we could, in a safe way, get that content recorded and just broadcasted regularly on a certain way so we're coming back to fundamentals so that if you can't use the computer, our next step will be how more can we make this information accessible? How more can somebody, a parent, know at 5 o'clock on Thursdays, I turn on the TV to get the weekly instruction for my first grader. Uh, and that's something that's mapped out. So I'm, I'm hoping you all can think about what do we have available in that true sense of, you know, Apollo 11, was it? Where like, hey, we got to get them home and this is all we can do to get them home. Here's everything, our tools at our disposal. Let's make it work. How can we do that with what we have? Um, and the other thing is how do we start connecting? And we're talking about this in the philanthropic field because public television has played a role for early learners, K KQED up here. Uh, KCET down in Los Angeles in, the, in Southern California um, of providing content to parents. But to what extent have we thought about building our own local partnerships at the cable access to our local affiliates in multiple language medium as well, including Spanish language medium, to carve out space to deliver instruction and have expectations measured. It's not to deliver instruction for the highest performing, maybe not necessarily the lowest performing, but enough for everybody gets something as a way we deliver instruction. So maybe we have numerous um, teachers of the year in our school district. Um, how do we work as another way to add that to a special assignment 
where we're trying to find creative ways to fill in the gap. And then the last thing I will say is, we know that we have a high number of English learners. Uh, for the first time, we have a set of English learners that we historically have a set of practice and information about called students with interrupted formal education. We can say that first time in the United States, we're going to have a number of students with interrupted formal education. And there are best practices that we, how can we transfer those to how you're designing how we're going to re-engage students who might have not just this instance, but until we overcome this pandemic, multiple rounds of interruptions. Maybe we go through the summer, maybe we go through the fall again, and then back in the winter, we're in, interrupted again. So I'm just trying to figure out how you can pull some of that best practice of how to work with students uh, with, and think about this. All our students have now will in fact exhibit uh, what are some of the things we see and supports that we know are needed for students with interrupted formal education. Every single one of our students is having that interruption right now. We're doing our best to reconvene, to provide and catch up, but that's a reality. So I was wondering if we can think about that, particularly for English learners. We have a high level number of English learners in our district. What are the ways that that gets mapped out? And, and last, I agree um, with folks. It's not too early to start thinking ahead that this could be one, two, three years of these cycles of interruption. And so the more we get our devices down and all those things, but the more we start thinking long-term of how are you now delivering education with this new schedule? that we might have of months on, months off, months on, months off. Um, and how are we doing it with what we have? And I leave it to you all, the brilliant people in our district to figure it out uh, and play our role to support you and drive resources. But let's think long-term if you can, in terms of, of um, how are we thinking outside the box and how are we preparing ourselves to consist consistently move students forward in the new context. Um, and set expectations around that. Uh, and let's say tomorrow a, a wand was, hopefully it's not too much of an impact, but let's say we go four months, we already decided we're closing until the end of May. That's a months of, of, of instruction that we're doing our best at, but it's not what it was before. There will be an impact of what it means for kids to have interrupted education and how are we gonna build that in to what we're, um, what we're creating for the future. Those are just my suggestions, and I thank everybody for all your hard work. May I also say something? Yes, students, uh, I don't know if my audio was working right now. Thank you, Trustee Cuevas and Student Trustees uh, Vasquez for Mala. Um, can you guys hear me? Because I don't know if you guys can hear me. I'm having trouble with my Wi-Fi as well. Okay. Um, I would just like to say, um, I was late to this because I was at another uh, another uh, Zoom with some other kids who we were talking like this about um about what's happening and what they thought of all of this um, complaints that we had um, and from all of that I was taking notes from that and a lot of the a lot of it was more personal stuff um more kind of like that like I said like being lonely and stuff it was less of like stuff from the district or like the schools and stuff. Um, so I, just, I think I think that the schools um, and the, especially the district has done a good job with this and taking control of this and taking initiative of this. Um, and I don't see too many of the kids that I know who who um, have any beef with this or who are really mad or have anything bad to say about the district right now and how they're handling this. So I'm really happy that that. Uh, Student trustee, I think your audio was paused. I can't hear you. here and there, of course. Um, but I think, I think this has been handled really well from all of you guys. Um, and I think people see that as well. And so that's, yeah, so that's what I would like. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, student trustee Vasquez Mala. Thank you. Did all board members get to uh, share? No, President Hernandez Jarvis, I just have a couple of thoughts. Um, one is to, of course, say thank you to everyone. 
uh, staff for all of the work that they've been doing. I know you guys have been putting in some long hours um, and for community for being flexible. Um, and also thank you to all of the folks who have helped with uh, handing out uh, the breakfasts and lunches. I'm glad that we're going to supper now. Um, and thank you for the people being willing to come out and get the help. And that's one thing that I do want to say to everyone. If you do need help, uh, there's no shame in it. Um, the help is there for you. Please come out, uh, get the breakfasts, get the lunches, get um, the suppers there for your families, your, your children. Um, and there's no shame in it. It's there for you for a reason. Um, I do want to take just a moment to um, talk about uh, the Chromebooks. Um, I had a conversation with one of our uh, kindergarten teachers, uh, David Alvarez, uh, and what he expressed uh, to me um, was that when we are purchasing our uh, uh, technology for our younger users for, for TK, kindergarten, first grade, that we really do need to um, purchase age appropriate technology for them, meaning technology uh, that their uh, fingers, little fingers uh, can use. Uh, and he has some really great ideas um, around what kind of technology works best for younger kids. Um, I understand that we give seniors, for example, Chromebooks. Um, that doesn't mean that we should give someone in TK uh, a Chromebook. So I understand right now we're kind of operating quickly um, and under an emergency. Uh, but if we do have to go out and actually purchase new devices um, for our youngest children, I want us to make sure that those devices are actually uh, user friendly for someone who is in TK, who is in kindergarten, who is in first grade. Uh, because the whole point is to get those kids to use them. Um, and, you know, it's always also sort of a, a, a gateway into um, using, you know, more sophisticated technology. The analogy that I like to use, um, and I think this simplifies it, is, you know, when you have a, a first grader, or somebody in kindergarten or TK, you don't give them, you know, that skinny pencil that adults or older kids use. Uh, to do their work. You give them a, a fat, thick pencil. And that fat, thick pencil uh, is something that is built or created to work with their fine motor skills or lack thereof at that age. And it's the same thing with technology, right? You want to give the younger kids the equivalent of that fat, thick pencil so they have a better user experience. And as they get older, they graduate into the same Chromebooks that the older kids have. Uh, so those are my comments on this, but again, thank you very much. If we are purchasing, or when we do end up purchasing, because I think it's going to happen, tech for the younger kids, let's make sure that it's user-friendly for younger kids. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Phillips. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, student Trustee Rydell, I see that you're uh, here with us as well. Um, I'm not sure if your microphone is working now, but if you would like to participate, if you have a comment. We cannot hear you still, but I'm really hoping that you can join us for the next meeting as well and that we can uh, figure out how we can uh, hear your comments by then. Thank you so much. Uh, so I, I want to begin just by saying, you know, thank you to our student trustee uh, Vasquez Lomala for sharing what your family is experiencing, what you're experiencing. Um, thank you for being so vulnerable and sincere about what's happening. And I'm really sorry for, uh, for your loss. And, and I hope that things start to take a better uh, turn for you, for your family and for everybody. And thank you as well for sharing uh, what your experience is as a student and what your peers are also communicating um, with you about. I also want to um, thank everybody for your flexibility, for your adjustments as we transition to completely virtual meetings. Um, I was having connectivity issues myself and got logged out and then I had to get back on here. So thank you to Trustee Lara too for facilitating those little times that I had to reconnect and get back to the meeting. Um, I also want to thank all the school district staff and families for all of their work and their patience. Um, and especially for everybody that is passing out meals 
I think that you're doing an incredible service that is essential. Um, I myself, when I was a, a child, uh, had my family uh, receive a lot of meals from our schools as well as go to the food bank to get food when we did not have enough at home in our pantry. So I understand what it's like when there's not enough to eat and when you're short, so you have to go and make use of these public services. So thank you for being out there and thank you to the staff that's ensuring that everybody has uh, masks on, gloves on, and that they're protected as much as possible during this pandemic. I also want to say thank you to our students who are adjusting during this pretty traumatic experience. I think that everybody is going through things differently, but I want to say that this is, you know, early childhood trauma for a lot of the little ones. It is also, um, it's also just like a stop in, in the social emotional development for our kids and academic development for everybody, you know, preschool through 12th grade and even the little We're, we lost you, uh, President Hernandez Jarvis. Long ago, and a dog, and so there were a lot of um, noises in the background. So thank you for your flexibility. Um, I have I have a few questions about the distance learning plan, and I just want to frame it in in a way of uh, empathy and unity and equity, because I think that to me those are the values that really stand out right now. Everybody's kind of on survival mode, and I think that we're beginning to structure uh, some type of normalcy, new normalcy for sure for our kids. And in doing so, I think we're providing routines that, that bring hope into the picture for all of our kids who are at home or at their parents' place of appointment um, during the days. And I just, I wanted to just touch back with the Chromebooks um, comments. I know that Ms. Logan explained in further detail and uh, some of the trustees had questions about that and I wanted to also express my concern that a lot of our youngest learners are staying behind essentially. Uh, the TK, kinder, and first grade students, they do need to have technology that is um, adaptable to their needs and I think that that's an issue of equity and of urgency. I think that we have had a couple of weeks when it's like we're gathering this information, we're moving this on, but I think that now is the time to really set the goal that by next week we'll have collected this information because then that would push us to order what we need to order ASAP or to figure out how we're going to get the devices in each of the student camps that need to have them. I I also want to just have an update. I want the board to know exactly how many Chromebooks need to still be purchased or how many tablets are necessary and the hotspots. So I appreciate the work that technology and Ms. Logan is doing. And I want the board to have um, a solid update on this next time before the next time that we meet. Um, if, and if that takes the form of a Friday memo, that, that would be um, okay with us, with me, as long as all of us get to see that information. Uh, I have a question specifically about the Google account. So I said that in the presentation that hasn't been posted yet, um, there was mention of Google Classroom and of Seesaw, and these are all technologies that I myself am going through as a teacher too. Um, and because I teach kindergarten, and I understand we have to really adapt things to each grade level differently. And so my question is, are principals collecting information from teachers specifically outlining that each student and each parent has received their login information for their Google account? Sorry, I was on. Um, I'm gonna ask uh, either Dr. Guerrero or Ms. Logan to answer that. Um, I think most of those folks have received um, login information over the year. So it would be if you're being given a Chromebook for the first time, um, that's when you'd be getting this login information. For example, many of our um, high school students who've had this stuff all year long have that but I'll defer to them to give the specifics of um, the login information. Thank you. And so, I'm asking specifically because of, sorry to interrupt Dr. Guerrero. I'm asking specifically because of the Clever, um, as we use it as a single sign-on uh, software for all of our kids to have access to vetted and secure um, online programs. So that's why I want to know if all of them have access to their Google account. So the uh, short answer is yes. Um, um, we have been um, um, we have been offered we have offered the experience of being 
one to one in grades second and twelve uh, uh, already for this year and uh, last year as as well. So uh, when the students took their device home or when they picked it up, it wasn't the first time that they accessed it, but they have had regular access to it as part of their uh, daily learning at the school. But also in the event that that wasn't such a regular use on the Friday before schools were officially closed, uh, that morning was spent on being able to review with students and giving them the access information so they can indeed uh, access that online platform. And then uh, in the afternoon, he was training teachers on how to be able to kind of uh, set up the Google classroom. Um, if, uh, if that wasn't uh, uh, communicated in, in any way, meaning that students, um, after being able to use these devices uh, on a regular, or perhaps not so regular basis when they were in, uh, in school, when school was open, and also if they didn't recall that information or took that information home on the early dismissal on that Friday, then the communication has, has been uh, from their teachers uh, as to how to be able to access that. Uh, I would say that there are very few students out there who have devices who do not know how to log uh, in. However, having said that as well, uh, we are in the process of creating a parent online training to be able to communicate this with the parents so that they can be able to also assist their kids in being able to troubleshoot and log in from home. So definitely uh, targeting this uh, aspect for them to be able to log in successfully from many aspects as well. And this will again be part of the check-in that we do with our students on that first week, which is actually next week as we go through with the extra structured uh, expectations plan uh, to be able to figure out um, who are our students who have a device at home but have not access because it could be uh, a technical difficulty or they're not clicking on the right thing or perhaps their device is just not working. You know, maybe their chargers aren't working properly. So definitely be able to assess that information, but definitely uh, being able to uh, ensure that that access is there, not just for the physical device, but also on how to be able to log in. Okay, thank you, Dr. Guerrero. And in terms of the, the resources that were pulled up, that were on the hyperlink um, in the blue, um, Font when we were having the presentation, I forget exactly which part it was, but there was a link that took us to the resources that were like for teachers, students, and families. And mm -hmm. I'm, I was trying to find that on the district website and I can't find it. And I remember having accessed it before and it was on the home page and it was like super easy, but it's not on there anymore. So I just want that to get checked out so that um, we make sure that we have it ready for families to access if they log in there because it's, it's not there right now. On the menu, I think if you go to uh, e-learning on the menu, you can be able to access it. I'm not on it now, so I'm not sure if that's still there, but that was on the uh, main page. You saw an e-learning mm -hmm. uh, on the top bar on the uh, main menu, and that would take you there. I'll double check though, just to ensure that that's there. I see the e-learning one right now. I'm checking it on my Mac on another computer, but it's not, my internet's not working on that in this computer for some reason. Um, I'll double check that. Yeah, thank you. Harvest. thank you. Thank you so much. And yeah, so my question was specifically about that because we use Clever to, to have kids have access to a lot of subscriptions and, and software that is secure mm -hmm. and that is safe for kids and that is uh, grade level and content appropriate. I just want to make sure that if we're making sure that they have the Chromebooks, that they also have the sign-on information and the parents know how to use it. So I'm glad to hear there's going to be training exactly. for parents too. And um, I just wanted to get an update too because I haven't seen if... Uh, um, if reading A through Z or Raskis or ABC Mouse or any of those specific things that target literacy and track progress for teachers are going to be used uh, systemically. Because I know that some teachers sometimes buy their own subscriptions or it comes out of site funds. And I just wanted to know how we're going to support that push for, um, you know, supporting teachers as they try to track the progress that students are doing at home independently. Right. So um, I know some schools have purchased that and we were actually looking at that to see um, what uh, purchase can be made district wide as well. Right now, uh, 
uh, we are um, including as part of the digital resources and apps that we include in the e-learning page is access to things that are being used now, whether it's on a district-wide um, basis or per site. However, as we are able to uh, collect more uh, data and feedback on what is working, what is not, what is needed, that's definitely something that we can be able to um, uh, see what we can do as a as a whole for the district. And uh, having had um, uh, having had RAS kids and, uh, and uh, reading A through Z as part of a uh, district wide uh, implementation before, I know that that's something that could help with the digital uh, divide of having been able to have that for literacy as well. So definitely we'll be following up, um, uh, especially since some, some of our campuses do have access to that, being able to double check to see if that's something that would benefit uh, district-wide as a whole. Great, thank you so much for that clarification. Um, and, and I look forward you know, to all of the consistent updates that mm -hmm. we've been receiving. Uh, I think that somebody may have asked when I was having connectivity issues about grading and attendance, I think that somebody was talking about that. So if that was discussed already, I'm good. But if, if there was if there was no mention of grading and attendance, um, could we have a like a very quick update? I we may have missed just, it. We mentioned really fast we're going to move to pastel grades for any grades that were formerly A to F. Um, but we haven't communicated that out to our whole system. That's where we are internally. But we want to move to pass no pass. Attendance we didn't talk about, uh, but attendance isn't um, like we don't have to do attendance to get state funding anymore. Yeah. And um, I was I was referring more to attendance in terms of like tracking participation and student uh, checking in. And I think that yes, you did yes, that. we did talk about that that we would we could monitor that, um, and by the end of the week we'll know a lot more about okay. who's logged in, who hasn't used technology, etc. Great, thank you. Um, and then now that we're working on the phase two, essentially, of the distance learning, um, when do we have a deadline for when that plan is going to be published to the, to the community? What's going to be published? The, um... Like the actual plan of like what we're, what we're doing? Because I know that there's updates. I saw that there was an update on the, on the district website, but it was kind of, I mean, it just, it had a very, Kind of plain overview. So yes. Of phase two. Probably you're gonna have questions. Yeah. Yes. For uh, for phase two, uh, is that what you're talking about, Mr. Andres Jarvis? Yes. Yes. So that was part of one communication to the uh, community, but I do. Um, I'm uh, I'm excited to report that I uh, I just saw today uh, the um, draft of a parent friendly uh, version of all of those. Uh, we have a preschool, we have a, a K first, second through six, et cetera, for the different levels, uh, a parent-friendly um, version that has been a result um, from the collaboration that our family and community engagement and parents uh, have, um, have led a work. And so we are uh, um, going to be that, we're going to make that available for, for the public uh, before the phase two starts, even if it's on that on that day, so that we can be on the same page with that. Uh, I really like the format. It's very visual. It's very much uh, centered around those different age groups, and um, I'm sure the the board will also uh, enjoy it. And of course, we'll get feedback because as everything involves, we'll be able to go to a 2.0 version of that as well, so that we can be able to capture what is going on in distance learning and be able to make it uh, be communicated as much as possible on parent friendly terms. But mm -hmm. certainly not taking credit for that because that's a result of a task force that's um, uh, composed of our family and community engagement folks and our parents mm -hmm. as well. Really proud of the work that they've done. Thank you for that update, I appreciate it. Yep. And I think in closing this section of, of my comments that I have for, for the specific part of distance learning, um, I think I forgot to say that when I was asking about TK through first grade, uh, when I was asking about the Clever, logging into Clever and the Google accounts, uh, for little kids specifically because they haven't gotten their Chromebooks, that means that they likely have not had that 
information yet. And I want to make sure that, especially because there's a lot of apps on Clever and programs that are specifically for little kids, I think that I just want to make sure that I get follow up on this um, in this part because I want to know that little kids are going to have the ability to log in once they get their Chromebooks or their tablets. Um, thank of course. You. And, and um, I, I heard a little bit about what the activities or lessons may look like once we kind of stabilize a bit more. And I understand everybody has been trying what they can during this time. I've been doing that myself too and having Zoom meetings with my uh, grade team, uh, with my two other uh, colleagues on the kindergarten team at my school. So I understand, you know, everybody's trying to have a sense of understanding and with a lot of information changing, we've had to adjust and be really flexible these past uh, three weeks. And, and I, so I, I thank all the teachers working on this. And I think that this, in this, I think a silver, a tiny, tiny silver lining in the work that we're having to do now virtually is that we have to reconfigure how we do collaboration. And we have to think about uh, how we're going to do systemic collaboration now so that there's equity across uh, the board. So for this specific purpose, my question is, if there are going to be grade level teams or content area teacher leaders guiding this work. So for example, um, something, and, and I'm not saying that we have to do exactly what we're doing at um, my school, but what we're doing is curating sets of activities that are going to be the same for uh, each grade level, and then teachers can add to it so that it, the work is streamlined. So for example, if you have at one school here, um, you can have all the teachers at the same grade level, like an elementary school, collaborate and craft the plan together so that the work is split up evenly. And if it's a DLI school, you can do that in the language, in the target language of your instruction. And then you send out that, that same activity to each family. So sometimes parents that have kids in different schools, they, they will have the same kind of template that says, you know, these are the activities for the week. And they don't have to be prescribed in the way that's like mandatory. Like you have to spend the, like nine to 10 doing this, but it's flexible. So parents can, you know, if they're working full time and they're coming home later, they can have the activities, you know, take two hours most. But but sending some kind of message to to the community that there's going to be equity and a baseline, um, because I, I'm hearing that there are some you know teachers who are doing a lot, and I just want to make sure that everybody's taking care of their family and everybody's also taking care of their students in a way that makes sense. So I wanted to hear what the district is doing in terms of ensuring that each child is going to have access to to activities that are you know, around equity and empathy. So um, uh, I think to answer your, your uh, first point about uh, teacher collaboration, which is what you were trying to get at and being able to kind of see where the collaboration would um, ultimately end in being able to provide this type of activities and equity for students. Uh, that is happening more and organized more at the campus level um, so that uh, to your point of being able to have perhaps uh, first grade level teams be able to plan and be able to really uh, uh, communicate equitable uh, activities, whether it's language-based or any other needs-based. That's happening more at the, uh, uh, at the site level, of course, them knowing a little bit more of what their community, of, uh, of what their specific community need, uh, needs are. Uh, at the district level, we do have, like I mentioned earlier, task forces that include teachers as well, and also as part of the office hours that, uh, that the uh, TLL team um, uh, has to be able to support teachers, and that's at 10 o'clock every day. And they also have uh, different PD, and board members are more than welcome to uh, attend those PDs. Uh, they have, uh, they're included in a calendar in our PD section with the learning. Uh, this week is pretty laid back uh, because folks are on, on spring break. And I think a lot of those trainings have to deal with a lot of pre-recorded things, which is again, a silver lining through this, this uh, distance learning that we could be able to access different things that have taken place as well. Uh, so then um, as far of, uh, as that support that we give to uh, uh, teachers, it may be that, uh, on a particular day, this training is only offered, or this gathering is only offered for first grade teachers, and they can be able to, to discuss developmentally uh, 
appropriate um, activities for them to be able to do. We also have folks from the multilingual department and special ed department being able to collaborate in a check-in that we have on a daily basis at one o'clock so that we can ensure that the different things that are planned and posted on the e-learning side uh, have these needs in mind as far as language needs for English learners and also differentiation that is needed for special ed students. Thank you, Dr. Guerrero. Mm -hmm. um, I have other comments to make. I'm going to make them, and any I, I know that I put some questions in this, but I really wanted to just share this because I feel like I'm going through this as a teacher and as a parent, too. And I know that my child's teachers are trying to figure out what to do because she's in preschool, so it's very different when we're talking high school, middle school, right. elementary, preschool, right? Uh, so I just want to share this. That's why I'm taking a few minutes longer today than usual because I feel like this is an area that I really uh, need to, to share about and, and let fellow board members know and uh, staff and, and the community too. So thank you for answering my questions. And I just wanted to um, share out, you know, that I still have more questions and would like to have more information for the board around how we're um, planning to help with as, as the, you know, we continue uh, to, to go on and we continue to build more robust structures for our kids during this very uh, trying time. How we're going to get physical supplies to kids that need it. So, for example, if they have a Chromebook but they need pencil and paper or coloring or crayons or markers, if we're planning anything around having pickups available during meal times, uh, maybe once a week or something, so that there's some kind of system to it. Um, and then just more clarification as we go into uh, later next week in the role of special education teachers, RSPs, instructional aides. Uh, how are we going to ensure that we're leaning on them to reach uh, kids who are the hardest to reach or who need that extra support uh, for their special education needs? And what kind of uh, teletherapy or phone services we're looking at to ensure that students with mental health needs are also being served during this time, even if it's from a distance? I, I think that it was great that you mentioned parental training and access and, and just the fact that we can offer that um, is very important. And I think that we should also be able to look into offering it in another language in Spanish. And focal student groups, I know community members have contacted me about specifically wanting to know more information and what does the ELL designated instruction videos or recorded lessons could look like, um, how we're going to reach African-American students uh, with direct and specific academic supports that we are provi providing currently or that we will continue to provide um, in a virtual setting and the allied students too, what resources there are for students um, studying in Spanish. I want to commend everybody who's working in the nutrition services and all the volunteers and the staff, everybody who has been working to get mobile um, groceries, mobile toiletries. I know that Mr. Duffy had checked in with me about getting some of that uh, going and I just want to uh, commend everybody who's working on that and I'm excited to hear about potential partnerships uh, in the near future. Um, thank you also Mr. Duffy for talking about the Ed Fund and I, I want to continue to say that we need to make sure that people know how to contact them uh, to get in touch for needs that they have because currently I, I have tried to figure out how to contact them and it only takes me to the donation Form. And so I think that I'm just trying to, you know, play with access and making sure that families who uh, may not speak English or who may not know how to access uh, internet sites have access to, to maybe a Google form asking for help. And I know that there's work by Ms. Blake being done for students without a home right now, students who are living in shelters who are currently homeless, so I thank her for that as well. And I think the communications department for consistently updating our communities and families and staff keeping everybody up to date with what's going on. And in closing, I want to say that I, I ask and I speak of all of these factors regarding our distance learning and our current circumstances because I deeply care you know, about our students and I wanna make sure that we do everything in our power to ensure that the digital, the academic and the social economic opportunity gaps do not get bigger during this pandemic and, and that they're not exacerbated in the next few weeks as we um, try to figure out the systems of learning that we're launching. And I want, to, I want to make sure that we continue to stay focused on helping our kids and making sure that their basic needs of uh, shelter, of food, of love are met and that we continue to help our communities to stabilize as much as possible during this time 
of um, survival and unexpected pause in all of our lives as we know them. And, and I think that we will be able to get through this together, but it's going to require uh, systemic collaboration and determination. So I, I thank you all for tonight's discussion and for the work that you do um, in front and at meetings and behind the scenes and everything that you do um, for your families and for all of the families in West Contra Costa. So I look forward to all of the updates that we will have. And if board members don't have any um, other comments, uh, then we can move on to the actual comments from the Board of Education at this time. Madam Chair, if I could just add very quickly, um, I do think the ensuring the safety and security of our board meetings during public comment is uh, very important. I think we have a responsibility to do that. And I would ask that we think about ways that are we're doing more um, kind of check-in points to help make sure folks who are doing public comment are in fact legitimate public commenters. And I would ask that the public bear with us because that might mean just like to get on a plane these days, there's a reason why everybody has to go through security, but it doesn't mean you don't get on the plane. It just means we're figuring out exactly why we're putting in those extra efforts of security. I would love for you all to devise a way that includes, uh, historically we've always asked for name, address, and um, phone number and maybe there is a mechanism by which we ask for pre sign ups for public comment with some verification on our end of calling folks back to determine there's a legitimate phone number on the other end that somebody answers so that that's a verification uh, and figuring out how legally other folks are doing this. Uh, I've heard other examples of other councils, other boards where people are asked to turn in their comments in writing and they read their comments and if they run out of time it's submitted for public record uh, that and how would we devise a mechanism for folks to get around that and still have access to giving comments but i just think now is a time for us to work diligently to preserve the decency of um, our public spaces because there are clearly bad actors out there that are taking advantage of all of our um, our good nature and our social contract with each other Thank you, Trustee Cuevas. I appreciate your comments and I echo that sentiment as well and, and the need to act urgently to make sure that we uh, continue to ensure our meetings are a space of respect. Thank you. Um, Trustee Cuevas, your mic is on. Did you have anything else you want to uh, share? I, I was going to make that same comment, but also just wondering, I don't know if it's possible with Zoom is to like have a, a delay uh, in the speakers, or maybe we're already doing that and not able to catch everything. But that was just my only other thought on that subject. Thank you, Trustee Bonas. Uh, so Mr. Duffy, um, it would be great. I think what I'm hearing is that we want to continue to, to step up our security measures and what is doable and what is, you know, um, legal to in the respect of public comment. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Great board members. Our next item on the agenda is item G, the next Oh, I'm sorry, item F, comments from the Board of Education and future agenda items. And we'll start with Ms. Lada again. Well, I think it's all been said. <laughs> I, uh, I, I, you know, continue what you're doing because I know everybody's doing the best they can. And from what I can see, the best is pretty, your best has been pretty amazing. And uh, continue the communications, because communication is really key because uh, we, you know, all of us as leaders and principal teachers, uh, district leaders, the superintendent, where people are looking to us for, for guidance, for uh, reassurance, for confidence in the future, for hope. And basically, I feel like what people want to know or what they want to hear and believe is you're not alone and this will pass. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Lara. Trustee Cuevas? Uh, just very quickly, thank you, everybody. I'm sending you um, lots of love and hugs and positive, virtual hugs and positive vibes. Um, I'm thinking about all of you. I'm wishing everybody goodness and health. And um, I'm thinking about all our communities. And let's just continue to um, hold each other in our um, best light and thinking and, and continue to um, use all our energy to help us get through this together. Thank you to our staff, to our superintendent, to our staff for doing amazing jobs. Thank you for putting up a hotline number for if anybody has questions, there's a common number to call. 
There's no reason why you don't have a number to get the responses that you need. And thank you to folks like Francie Kuniak and other folks who are doing um, outreach immediately addressing those com comments to both staff and families. And I just want to tell everybody that I feel, your, I feel you. I feel your pain and your empathy of all the things we've lost, uh, graduation, all those things. But we know we have the capacity to make all those things up in the best way we can. So be good and be well, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Cuevas. Trustee uh, Sana. Thank you. Thank you, President Hernandez Jarvis. I'd like to thank all of our teachers and principals and all other members of our staff for all the work that they're doing to move us forward in this new way of teaching and learning. <clears throat> I truly appreciate all the people who are out there, who are out there serving food every day to our vulnerable populations. Um, I did that for the first three days at Richmond High. <clears throat> it was a lot of work and it was also a lot of pleasure. Uh, we went from 450 to 650 to over 1,000 people served in those three days. And it was really exciting to see that. And I sent a note to Ms. Jellison after that third day thanking her for the great work of her team. They actually, third day, they actually came and had to resupply us twice. Um, the Teachers College Weekly Office Hours two weeks ago was really great. A useful session for sharing findings about distance learnings. Um, <clears throat> A couple of weeks before we actually closed the schools, I was over at GRIP and they gave us this certificate for the work uh, that we're doing to help support their homeless populations. And I'll be sending that to, to um, Mr. Duffy. Um, there was an AXA uh, training seminar about distance learning last week, which was really useful. It was a school in Hong Kong that's been doing this for three months. And they had so much useful learning from there. Um, and there was a, another teacher's college session on distance learning and bilingual read-alouds a couple weeks ago. And it was 95% not bilingual uh, in terms of the read-aloud function. But a lot of great information and some great tools came out that I sent to some principals and teachers. And they were really happy with that. So thank you, everyone, for all the work they're doing. And I, I share the pain of, of the schools not being open and all the things the seniors are going to miss and the companionship. All of our kids are missed, but we're going to get through this. So thank you. Thank you so much, Trustee Panas. Trustee Phillips. Um, hello. I want to first apologize to the teacher that I referenced earlier uh, in the meeting. His name is not David Alvarez. It's Keith Valdez. I had somebody else on my mind, uh, but he is the teacher, uh, kindergarten teacher out in Hercules, who's doing a fantastic job uh, with his class on Zoom and who I had the conversation with about age appropriate uh, technology for our younger students. The other thing that I wanted to talk about very briefly uh, in relation to our budget uh, and the reductions that need to be made, uh, staff was very clear with us or has been very clear with us uh, over this period of time that we needed to hit a certain mark uh, for next school year. Um, and I still want that mark to be hit um, because you told us, staff, that we had to, and that if we didn't do it, that we were uh, going to have increased financial problems. Um, and we also told the community that we were going to do that. And we also told uh, the county that we are going to do that. So I want us to stick to uh, our commitments around reductions for this year. Um, so we're not just kicking this down the can, uh, or kicking this can down the road um, into someone else's lap. Uh, the other thing that I want to talk about very briefly is Let's Go Learn. I've talked about that uh, for the last few years. I really do believe that they can help uh, through this process. Uh, it's a very powerful online learning tool, um, and I have asked that they be allowed to do a presentation uh, to the board um, so that they be placed on a board agenda in, I believe, May. And the last thing that I want to say in closing uh, is to my kids. You're at home watching. Uh, Papa loves you. I will be home uh, very soon. So Marist, uh, Mr. Sterling and Amanzi, uh, I will see you in a second. Love you. Thank you, Trustee Phillips. Thank you, everybody. I just want to commend again everybody who is working, who is passing out meals, who is connecting with their students, who is supporting their kids from
I think we lost you. Yeah, as we uh, navigate through these changes. Uh, thank you, everybody, and I appreciate everybody. So with that, we um, conclude our comment from the Board of Education, and our next scheduled Board of Education meeting will be on Wednesday, April 22nd, um, and it will be virtually as well. I know it says Dijon Middle School um, in the abstract, but it's it will be virtually on Zoom. So I hope to see everybody there. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. Uh, Thank you. Meeting adjourned at 9.19. Thank you.